Okay. Good evening. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Dr. Pro Africa Day song. I'm Ego. I have with me Baruti and Nandi. How are you doing? Good evening, everyone. Love. Well, good evening. Great, great to see you, gentlemen. Uh, so, today's topic, I'll get straight into it. Uh, it's one that has been um, simmering under, under the teapot for a while and has taken different dimensions uh, in different um, guys. But um, the topic for today is Worlds Collide, Africans and African Americans. Uh, worlds Collide. Africans and African Americans, I think I had a different, uh, let me see how I titled it specifically. So the reason for this um, topic um, is there has been, I mean, due to the advent of, um, you know, proliferation of uh, uh, internet uh, uh, and Africa, there's now been an explosion of people on social uh, who've been entering that space and searching and finding uh, things, uh, um, new, new, new horizons, new perspectives. And there's also now been, uh, for the first time in history, a means of which a vast distance. This is now brought um, Africans into contact is, who we all know obviously through the slave holocaust have been dispersed uh, across the Americas, North America, South America and Caribbeans um, and have been separated from the uh, homeland over time because it would be almost half a year. So now that there is the internet growing the penetration on the continent is about 30% but there have been people who have now come into contact with, and not just through uh, film and music, and not contact or conversation with and vice versa. So this has now created a whole brand new paradigm because over time of this uh, separation, um, there has been, there have been, um, there has been, uh, I would say, um, learnings, teachings, things that people have uh, prejudices that have been taught or have been propagated, um, different stereotypes. Is that you, Nandi? Okay. There, um, there have been different stereotypes that have been propagated, uh, a lot of false and propagated over time about each other, um, stories. Uh, is created to uh, and, and various other uh, insidious uh, reasons. And now that those two entities are coming into contact with one another, Africans on the continent and Africans in the United States and beyond, um, there seems to be a, a growing uh, discontent through some of the things that have been on social media, I have been myself at the brunt of exchanges, which all of them seem come from a lack of understanding of each other, lack of community. In essence, it's people are making first contact with each other and starting to break down those walls, those, those prejudices that have been formed over time. Some of it also, also has been formed with uh, by into, uh, my to the United States, and that section of that population have given an impression, good or bad, to those in the United States, which has also Just having this proliferation, different people coming in contact with each other, and some are, uh, some are, and we just wanted to use this show to try to figure out and discuss 
uh, what the dimensions are in these worlds colliding uh, to try to create or devise a better way uh, of this interaction in bringing about a fruitful and long-lasting cooperation over time uh, to help both people on both continents uh, unite uh, for a determined purpose. So that's, that's the purpose of this um, conversation. So with that being said, um, I don't know if you had any thoughts on what I just said, both of you, with regards to the, the premise on the internet bringing people together and people now having to interact text through Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and not having a face-to-face -face, uh, interaction with someone and what those in trying to foster a first contact uh, 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 for the airspace. So I don't know if you have to my introduction. I will get into details. The you know the if is used um, can be used constructively and deconstructively, and um, whatever passions people have is amplified through the ability to use uh, the internet and other um, aspects of of social media. So I feel like. Um, efforts to resolve conflict, conflict management, conflict resolution um, should be, you know, a primary importance to try to build both consensus and interface uh, so we learn to talk to each other, um, you know, not just at or around you know, each other. Um, would be the comments that I would make, you know, just starting out, just in a way of kind of setting the tone of, of the reach and the. Okay. Namdi, any thoughts into the details? Um, yeah, I want to say that this. Um, this discussion has been ongoing even before the advent of the internet. Okay? But it's been largely localized. But the advent of the internet will now be on social media. And the providers of the new staff more broadly. And I that's uh, from this once and for all. Mm. Yep. Part of the technical issues will be on shortly. Wow. Very strange. So why is this a problem? No, can't hear. To try to reset the mic. Okay. I think he's trying to reset his microphone. Okay. But I can put this bit out. Mm -hmm. How about now? Okay, Perfect. I can hear you. Excellent. <clears throat> okay. Now let's get straight into it. Yes, can hear you, can see. Yes, yes. Perfect. Perfect, perfect. Now make sure. Okay. So um so as I 
good good for the um the topic uh, I know you gave me Namdi was giving me his points of view uh, I think Namdi you said um it's it this issue always existed it was just um now uh on social media due to the internet um so first of all i'll just ask you your question do you see a difference now that it's on social media as opposed to how it existed before i see on i see an opportunity for us to have this conversation broadly but at the same time i if i, I think i think the conversation is not being held I see an escalation and even even confrontation um, taking place because um, we've been seeing in the last couple of um, years uh, <clears throat> in some instances a breakdown of the relationship on both sides of the Atlantic. So I think this is a source of concern and uh, there is need for us to begin to address this issue with a view of building bridges um, across the Atlantic. So yeah, the internet has provided us an opportunity for us to hear for the first time what the issues are from both sides of the Atlantic and uh, begin to take steps to address it. Okay. I, I was just saying something that I said, I, I feel there's a lack of understanding from both parts but I think that I think sometimes there's more of a misunderstanding on the part of African Americans than of the Africans, um, because a lot of a lot of topics and allegations have been made from African Americans towards Africans a lot more than the other way around, in my opinion, about a number of things. Um, there's been the the, the aspect of um, Feeling that uh, you know, being called coons, saying they don't, um, they want to suck up to to the white man whilst they're in the U.S. They don't want to live in the same community. They want to live uh, close to the white man. They don't. Uh, they, they they don't want to integrate. They come in and not. Um, they leverage off the uh, successes and um, one on the part of the African American. And they don't pay any acknowledgement or homage to the groups when they're there. They, uh, this is they meaning um, continental Africans. Um, they they see themselves as better uh, as a group. They because they they go further, uh, or they 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 are more they go further in education. They have more educated on average per capita or something like that. Um, and then even more recently, in instances such as uh, in the in the movie, uh, in the movie world, in the cinema world, where actors and actresses are now being um, somewhat demonized uh, for getting roles um, to play African American people in the U.S. when they're coming from the continent of Africa, and even a, a petition is being made. Uh, against uh, a Nigerian lady by way of um, of UK uh, for being given a, a role or part to play Harriet Tubman. Um, we all know Harriet Tubman was a uh, an abolitionist. Uh, she was enslaved and freed herself, and then free and went back and freed um, uh, more slaves over time. So, um, and there, there was. Um, the proposal, I don't know if it was carried out or not, for her to be put on a $20 bill in the United States. Um, so there's this guardedness uh, against Africans from the continent and not being seen as brethren. Uh, the argument is both sides uh, perpetrated, but on one side, it's being exhibited more. So I don't know what you would have to say to that, Bertie, or if, if you think those are... Well, I, I probably have some comments, but just continue on with the dialogue and then, you know, I'll try to address from my perspective just some questions that you 
that you have like specifically and then we can kind of r- roll into it but okay. i think you outlined perhaps in general some of the some of the concerns i i do think that the complaints and some of the misunderstandings more so happen in the United States because the different immigrating groups in this particular highlight, uh, you know, people from African countries are coming to the United States, uh, you know, setting up a new life and interacting and interfacing with, you know, African American people, mm-hmm. and other people mm-hmm. in the United States, as opposed to it being a situation where, you know, African Americans and any type of um, sizable uh, mass are going to various African countries and interfacing with the population there. So I think that's why more of the weight of the misunderstandings. Uh, are being tallied up by African American people uh, and made as a challenge to uh, African immigrants here. Okay, the um, the, the thing that I, I I think about is um, and I, obviously I'm living in the UK. Um, my thing has always been that this. This is more or less almost a natural phenomenon that it has been unfair to to expect the continental African to come en masse. We're not, we're not talking about you know people who like Kwame Nkrumah or individuals who've come and shown solidarity and, and stood for things and fought alongside people. We're talking about people who who have left uh, their countries, their home countries and families and, you know, their lives to go to see greener pastures. And their only allegiance has been to go and see greener greener pastures. That it has been unfair to expect them to have an obligation for all the things that have been Posted on on onto onto the continent of African being they 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 are impeding on some of their their struggles or ignoring some of their struggles, um, not paying uh, um, acknowledgement to it, um, segregating themselves from certain communities. And my argument has been some some of these. Uh, histories would not be known to a lot of people who immigrant or migrants who go to the US. They wouldn't have any knowledge of this. They wouldn't have any inclination of this. Their, their, their first and foremost obligation would be to their families and to their survival and to um, their, their, their extended families in some cases. And case in point is, or to, to buttress that, is we we've seen um, the accounts or reports of, of remittances to Africa um, in large numbers. So it just that to me exemplifies that um, the the purpose of being in these lands is not necessarily to even fully integrate into them. It is to go there for the purpose of uh, um, progress and prosperity. And once they have that, hopefully, I think the plan is return, build up um, um, the, the communities or the families and be able to support them and to live that way. But I think the misunderstanding is that there's been a challenge when people have gone to that uh, to the United States to, to trample upon the, uh, the African Americans there and, and their, their, their history and their livelihood. And I think it's been an unfair one. And it seems to be one that's widely held, uh, which is just a thing that I'm not really sure that anyone has gone any way to try to explain that. Uh, 
I just, I just don't know. I mean, um, I, there are just so many things I would <laughs> probably like to say. I just don't exactly know where to, um, where, where to start. Um, why, why don't you just ask me some specific questions and I can try to delve into it as best I can. Okay. Well, I'll ask you, do you, do you think in your mind that there is an issue or a valid issue with some of the points that I've raised that Africans are doing wrong when they come over to the United States, that Africans should do or are obligated to do when they come to the United States that they're not doing? And if so, is this is uh, are they being sinister as been as has been allegated against them? Are they doing something sinister, or are they just, or as I'm saying, are they just pursuing uh, the American dream? Well, all right. If you if you look at Again, continental Africans coming to the United States. In some cases they're doing wrong, and then in other cases, African Americans are doing wrong. Um, it's going to be wrong all the way around, all the way around, because the United States is basically a racialized country with, you know, African American people, in this case, African American people, African people, or black people on, on the bottom. So there's just nothing right about the U.S. in that particular kind of way. So anytime you're going to have a racial environment, then all kinds of miscues can uh, become ignited for division between a race of people who are the same race but represent different ethnicities and therefore cultural experiences uh, in, in, in the process. So there's got to be a way to bridge the differences in a healthy way of interface and a conduit for us to talk. And that's got to be one of the main goals in mind. So in that sense, I would like to say that, again, the United States started out as an English colony with different strands eventually of people that came from what we would now know as Britain or UK. So mostly initially of English stock, but you know, then significant uh, portions of people from Ireland, Wales, Scotland, who had to learn to put aside their differences to get along for the larger purpose from their uh, consensus to be white. So, and then expanding from there to basically welcome in other kinds of Europeans other than the UK group. But then a further expansion of European then expanded generally to Caucasian to represent people who were from other uh, strains who may not be a European, but who are classified under Caucasian. So this would include uh, Arabs, 
and other people of Middle Eastern background in general. I'm only saying that because there were efforts in the U.S. to solve tensions uh, early on for unity purposes and interface purposes to connect Caucasian peoples. But because of the dynamics of the country, um, that hasn't necessarily been a complete focus amongst different African peoples uh, for the same goals. And because we haven't had that type of conduit and uh, interface for some varying reasons, um, we find a schism that seems to be widening, particularly with the um, advent of social media between or amongst people who have see themselves as uh, immediate Caribbean immigrants and then people who descend from that in the immediacy and the same would go from immediate uh, or recent African immigrants and those children of African immigrants and then you have the population of African Americans who have um, had ancestry uh, spanning back 400 years in the United States with different people at varying times in the history of the country immigrating in primarily due, through different eras uh, of, the slave, of the slave trade. So um, I think we have to kind of get into those dynamics about why the interface has not taken place as much and what have been the barriers to the interface and what can be done to put a conduit and interface in time, uh, you know, put together an interface measure that will, you know, to continue to promote, uh, you know, dialogue and understanding as it will be best from a stress standpoint of all of the different African descended peoples who live in the United States, irrespective of how they got here and when and what time, to basically be able to get along here in the U.S. In the US. And what challenges will that um, will that entail? Mm. And, and just to say, I think as, as the conversation goes along, my, my hope, and I'm sure it is the same as, as yours, is that we, we come to the end of it with a kind of consensus um, in, 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 in mind of, of the way forward. Because I'm watching that, that a lot of what you've just said, um, people are not thinking of our interaction with that background. They're not thinking of this, this new interaction with that in mind. They're, some of them are thinking about it or coming to it with a kind of animosity already to begin with, with some falsehoods or some, some other facts. Um, and it's, 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 it's the basis of the way the interaction is now being forged that I think that is where the problem lies. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that needs to be dispelled uh, or disproven and, and fully addressed before we get deep into it and then we now start to need a uh, resolution. So, um, I think... But, but there, are no, there, are no things, there are a lot of things that, um, you know, some African-Americans have complained that Africans do that they don't seem to understand. Um, I mean, the HBCUs was one point in question. Um, the sacrifices that African-Americans have made in the U.S., you know, during Jim Crow, um, the March for Civil Rights, you know, even the slave revolts. These are these are price ultimate prices that African Americans paid to pave the way for continental Africans and the Caribbeans to take advantage of. As we all know, uh, a lot of the founding fathers from the African uh, African continent. Um, 
got admission, courtesy of prominent African Americans, to come and study in the US for free. The likes of Kwame Nkrumah, the likes of Namdi Azikiwe, the likes of Dennis Asadebe, the likes of Juan for Rizzo, and, and lots, lo loads of other Africans who have benefited from the sacrifices the Africans and Americans have paid. Um, you know, African Africans who are uh, African continental Africans who are residents in the U.S. I even go, I, I've even gone as far as even you know getting admission into Ivy League institutions, Yale, Harvard, Princeton, and just um, just to mention a few. All these were sacrifices that African Americans paid. I mean, they fought for slavery. They fought. They fought Jim Crow. And they, you know, they fought for the um, desegregation of schools in the U.S. You know, benefits of which a lot of continental Africans who are residents on in, in America have benefited from. Um, but we don't see any, any kind of um, recognition from the African residents in America of the sacrifices that these people have made. And I don't think that's 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 not, that's unfair. What what so, what kind of recognition would you, what what kind of recognition would you have in mind that you think uh, continental Africans who are in the United States should should demonstrate in in, in order to uh, in, in your view show appreciation recognition of the fact that there were these people were the ones who opened the doors for them to come and get their education. That is the truth. How do they not show that now? How, how how do continental Africans, in your view, not not show that appreciation? They don't even talk it. They don't they don't show it because they don't even discuss it at all. They don't discuss it. They don't even talk about it at all. And I don't think it's I don't think it's right because they are benefiting from it. I don't think it's right. I think. But hold, hold on, hold on a second. But but are you saying that a recognition should be shown that? Some continental Africans were able to go and study in the U.S. Yeah, because schools in the U.S. before um, before schools were de desegregated were largely segregated. You understand? So they were limited. Yeah, they're, 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 but but why do you want Africans in general to acknowledge that? Shouldn't it just be because they are the families of those people? Because they are benefiting from hmm? this educational system because because of the sacrifices that african americans have made africans can now on the continent get a scholarship straight to harvard get a scholarship straight to princeton those ones that are residents in the u.s can even you know benefit from affirmative action these were sacrifices of people who were who people african americans have made they 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 they, they, they paid the ultimate price they were lynched dogs were you know put on them you know, I mean, I listen, I listen, I listen to the um, um, show that um, um, O'Shea and uh, a group of other Afri African Americans, uh, um, YouTube, um, YouTube, YouTubers, and uh, African uh, African uh, um, YouTube owners as well were discussing earlier, and 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 you know, it gave me an insight of um, you know the challenges both groups have faced and you know issues that have been um, they, they've gone through that uh, have um, you know in, you know indirectly built some kind of resentments underneath the surface you know i mean this hbcu issue is just one of them i mean i i know i know for sure that the likes of likes of Kwame Nkrumah and Kwame Nkrumah is one individual that you know, african americans celebrate because he was one. He was one African leader who who really made an effort to bridge that gap. Okay, but he just just he was just one. There were other African leaders who benefited from that HBCU system. You know, um, I mentioned another one again, um, Namdi Azikiwe. Namdi Azikiwe was one of them. I mean, he got a scholarship to go to England to study, but he turned that down and rather chose to go to the United States to study. You know, again, another beneficiary of the HBCU. As a matter of fact. He set up a, a union called um, the the Igbo Union. This was um, um, immediately after uh, immediately after independence, or sure, before independence, and worked closely with prominent African American intellectuals who were 
heads of institutions like Tuskegee, heads of institutions like Michigan State University, um, heads of, um, you know, um, professors of the uh, University of Pennsylvania that, you know, that gave them access to scholarship board that literally sent a generation of Africans to go to the U.S. to study. Again, this scholarship that, you know, provided the, the, the framework for, for continental Africans to benefit from was largely set up by African Americans. That's the truth. This is the honest truth. And the benefit okay. from them. And, and, and those ones who benefited from them, they then laid the foundation for their own descendants to come after them, to take advantage of it. So we've seen in the last 50 to 60 odd years, you know, a generation and after a generation of, 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 of Africans who are going to the U.S. to study. I mean, all this, this, um, this, um, this trend has, a, had a, has an origin. And all I'm saying is that there were some people who paid the price for people to benefit from it. That's all I'm saying. Okay, all right. Um, Namdi, I, I agree with you about your outline of African Americans paying the paving the way for African immigrants to benefit from some things in the US. Um, I appreciate that. Let let's start. Uh, like like I said, this is an entangled situation about where the conflict rises. So I guess we have to just start somewhere. But let me say, when, when Kwame Nkrumah and um, Namdi Azikwe came to the United States and studied at, uh, at Lincoln University in Pennsylvania, as an HBCU, you were right, at the time, the United States was largely um, segregated and historically black colleges served as uh, centers where various um, you know, African exchange students could get an education in the United States. Um, of course, there were a few, uh, you know, African exchange students that would go to um, northern universities that were not, uh, you know, in the South and obviously were not segregated. But if they were going to school in the South, uh, they went to uh, historically black um, colleges uh, in general. Particularly um, a school like Howard University in Washington, D.C. has had a long history of educating significant um, amounts of international students who are black from varying countries in Africa and also the Caribbean. Um, now, I say that because I don't think in that particular time frame, 1940s, 1950s, uh, up until the mid 1960s, it was ever seen as a problem because most of the students who came, you know, after they finished their degrees, they left and went back to their respective countries. So the African American colleges that helped to educate them were seen as a vessel and a vehicle to um, you know, launch the educational uh, careers and journeys of various uh, African peoples uh, in the diaspora and the continent for them to go back to the countries in which they came. So it was not seen as though these particular people, their families and other people were making treks to the United States uh, in which um, whatever the struggles of the African-American people were, would be somehow impacted in a negative way by the presence of, um, you know, new black people who are immigrants. So you just didn't have that. So basically before 1965, 
the newly arriving uh, black people who were immigrants to the United States were for a temporary period of time, then they left. It was only after 1965 that the um, floodgates of the U.S. in terms of people from uh, a variety of countries other than European ones were opened up for people to immigrate to the U.S. to generally become, become citizens. Okay, so the waves of various people from Africa and the Caribbean coming to the United States in the 1970s began to create more of a groundswell that results in some aspects of, of competition. Okay, so again, in the U.S., you have this black population that's been struggling in all kinds of ways under different levels of white supremacy, um, trying to make inroads and gains, political levels, economic levels, um, you know, trying to go through all kinds of protests to create affirmative action programs that would um, try to level the playing fields in terms of, you know, jobs, professional jobs, particularly in industries that black people had been barred from. Okay, so with varying levels of success and also regression in these programs, the dwindle in opportunities for African American people has left a lot of African American people feeling marginalized in all kinds of ways. So the grievances that African American people have had have not been addressed before more significant amounts of uh, black people who are immigrants to the U.S. have come and multiplied, um, might have a different agenda and different perception of the United States. For them, it might be, you know, strictly looking for a, a, a better life without in any way feeling any kind of baggage about struggle in the U.S. from a black pr perspective. Um, so, and some of it has been kind of like bad timing. And also, uh, because of the marginalization in the U.S. of the African-American population, there are all kinds of uh, tensions and negatives that's built up between whites and blacks who are already here. So, when you start, when we start talking about new black people who are coming to the United States, then there's different perceptions about the newcomers versus the uh, ones who are already here, or so the narrative uh, goes. So I think that in general, because, I mean, in the late 1960s, you have the Pan-African movement, you've got the black, uh, you know, the black power movement, which is basically trying to promote, in some ways, Afrocentricity. This movement sort of faded a bit, picked up again with some steam in the mid to late 1980s, you know, where people are seeing everything from a more Afrocentric standpoint, at least that is the, is the projection. But as different retreats by the government and the sentiment of the country on affirmative action programs and as white nationalism continues to be more visible than uh, African Americans feel as though, you know, different um, impediments are constantly occurring on programs that African Americans fought to put in place. So now with the black people who are immigrants coming in place who, um, you know, don't have any particular legacy connection to those kinds of programs and may just feel as though, you know, I'm just going to come to the U.S. and do well. The overall white society 
creates a narrative where these people who are coming are seen as people who don't want anything from the government and African American people are painted with the narrative that they do. They don't want to work for what they get. And they're always complaining and they're always talking about racism. So we have all those dynamics so that um, I would say the white society overall does think that there is a big difference between the African American population and the newly arriving immigrants. And they use that narrative to generate, um, you know, additional hostilities, uh, you know, in general. So what we don't have and what we haven't had is a kind of um, an effort, I think, on the particular part of the people to have a functional incubator to sort of like socialize uh, new black immigrants into the United States into a space, intellectual space where they're understanding, you know, what's going on in the U.S. or ways of, you know, trying to interface. HBCUs, I think, would be a great um, a way of doing that. But since that hasn't had as much success as I would like, or maybe the effort hasn't been there, then in general, more African and Caribbean immigrants who are coming to the United States do not in any way help the socio-cultural or socio-economic condition or position of African American people at all. Um, so much to, to the sort of to the difference of let's say Hispanic groups or even Asian groups there are different types of Hispanic people in the United States but they have managed to try to work out their differences and sort of you know understand politically that it's to their advantage uh, to go underneath the, the label of Hispanic because each of these groups more like generally has been a fairly recent immigrant and still are connected to their respective countries, whether it be to Cuba or whether it be Mexico, or whether it be Guatemala or Costa Rica or whatnot so that each independent Hispanic ethnic group still is connected to their former country and therefore they have relationships going on with their individual country and so they can put their political weight together and leverage themselves underneath one uh, umbrella because they're not creating, a, they're not stepping on one another because each one of those individual groups has their own leverage as another from another country to, of which to build their own ethnic strain, they just kind of come together. The same thing with the Asian peoples in the United States who are of different strains, the major ones being, you know, Korean people, Vietnamese people, um, you know, Chinese people, um, you know, East Indians. They still all work from the basis that they work with their resources from their own respective countries, but can put together their political um, power in, in the United States. So because the African-American person is not in that position where they're connected with another country, then that means that there are no leverage resources that the African American person has in the United States. So therefore we are more vulnerable people that because of our positioning get sort of stepped on in certain ways by other groups of people. And then on the racialized hierarchy, 
coming on the, the bottom end of the racism, then other groups sort of like move ahead. Now, do I think that African-American people could, could do better than what we're doing, even with the um, disadvantages? Yes. A more pan-African attitude amongst ourselves, um, you know, uh, cleaning up certain views, values, and habits that may um, sort of bring down certain segments of the community. Yes. Um, but we are kind of a disadvantaged group because we don't have a connection with another, in my view, uh, an African nation by which to call a, sec a second home. And I think that all of these things kind of impact the, um, the relationship. And also, when people from the continent or the Caribbean come to the United States, um, they're being filtered into the United States with certain negatives about African American people. And this affects the kind of African American people they may come in contact with based upon the stereotypes that they're being fed and also um, some of the self fulfilling prophecies that they may see among certain segments of the African American community that. Um, that you know, kind of give rise to the the stereotypes. Let me say this one thing. I'm sorry to be so long winded, but I it was the best I could do in terms of trying to get into the complexities of what you're you've both of you have sort of um, brought up. Um, unfortunately, components of African American culture today has been sort of enshrouded within this rap and hip hop cultural uh, facade. I think that's wrong, but let me say that prior to the 1980s, you know, the predominant genres of music that African-American people dominated, created, and spread across the landscape of the United States was primarily gospel, um, R&B, and jazz music. Um, these forms of music represented the high culture, H-I-G-H, the high culture of African-American people uh, that basically uh, spawned the music culture and genre of music throughout the entire United States. We're also talking about eras and time in which um, our African Americans are taught to be respectful of, of elders um you know uh had more fathers in the homes basically had intact families despite you know massive racism and other obstacles of apartheid of marginalization and also keeping in mind that um you know views and imagery of African peoples living in the United States is negative, images of Africa was negative, and we were using all that we could to fight against that, even down to negative perceptions of ourselves and colorism issues within the black communities. These are all toxic, um, you know, limitations of living living in a Euro environment. And a, a racist one at the at the core foundation. So um, despite that, we had made you know tremendous um, achievements given the odds that were against us. You know, succeeding in um, in all fields of endeavor. You know where where we could, but some of the hastened slide down 
from that level, say 1970s, I think came from the collusion of a couple of things. One is that the retreat on uh, affirmative action programs of the late 1960s and early 1970s for job hiring of black people in different professional arenas retreated because whites were generally against these programs. They thought that those programs were racist. And uh, again, black people were marginalized in terms of uh, you know, our power within the country to sustain those kinds of programs. So therefore, there were retreats on that, uh, retreats on what was perceived as, you know, continued upward mobility for the masses. So, you know, like any, with any group that has various segments that feel like they're marginalized, then there becomes, you know, despair and um, a retreat on hope. Well, some of the, um, ideas about the creation of the rap music to speak to, you know, life in ghettos, life in poverty amongst certain African-American groups um, got supported by, uh, you know, white record industries who put monies behind the creation of uh, rap, which basically in many cases appeal to the low culture of African-American life. I mentioned to you the creation of the hip hop, I mean, I'm sorry, the creation of R&B, uh, soul music, um, uh, and jazz were the high culture. A lot of the rap was the low culture, and it got promoted uh, all over the country and became mainstream. Some of this started taking the African-American people, some aspects off track in terms of respect for authority, how people present themselves, the language uses toward other people and to themselves, uh, you know, all kinds of, um, you know, negatives um, because people began to see themselves as, you know, a downtrodden community. And this is the way we we're gonna solve problems you know, con without conflict resolution, just violence, et cetera. Now, this isn't the whole African-American community. These are varying segments, but the segments became part of the cultural narrative as, as you know, projected. So some of the negative images that um, I think that some of the African immigrants groups perceive regarding African-Americans are things that they watch on television, watch in stereotypical fashion, which does not speak for the entirety of the African-American community, which we have a lot of very successful people. But negative images can be used to um, broad brush a community and can be used as a narrative tool uh, for miscues and misunderstandings. And I think that on the African-American part, we haven't recognized how uh, negative narratives affect relationships with other people in this particular case. Oh, I, th I, th I think your, your audio has gone a bit low. Okay, is it still gone? It's back now. Okay, I, I, th I think that these miscues, um, you know, were not recognized because we didn't pay much attention to how building relationships um, is key to empowerment and to how you're seen and how you're treated and how you interact with others. We just didn't see that, I think, as a, as a powerful entity. So we didn't do as much as I think we should have in terms of allowing negative segments in our community to be hijacked as a narrative that got broad brushed over the, over the entire group. So I think that some of those negative images are seen 
uh, by you know immigrant groups who are fed some of those narratives before coming to the United States and some of the interactions that they have with some African Americans sort of document that. But I think that our community is a large community and we have a lot of people that are very knowledgeable about Africa, are open-minded and are nice people on all kinds of social cultural levels that um, many black people who are immigrants to the US could could make make friends with. Um, so I just kind of wanted to just kind of paint that, um, you know, in general. But like I said, the slide down in terms of negative imagery about the communities, I think started in the, um, you know, in the late, uh, late 1970s. And it's where it is now. Other negatives, um, you know, kind of do take place because when many of the African and Caribbean immigrants come to the United States, they quickly see that African American people are thought of in a negative sort of way, and they get the impression that if they stay away from African American people, which some are encouraged to do in general, they feel like they may be better off or that um, somehow their their journey in the United States is going to be different from the African-American person as long as they can distinguish themselves in, in, in that in that regard. So that's where I kind of wanted to just set the tone and then see if you have some questions about some of the things that I'm saying as the basis for our, our continued dialogue. Hello, Chris, you hear me? Okay, th th thank you, Bridget, for that very detailed account of what, of the perspectives, uh, from your perspective of, of the genesis of the initial integration and how things um, were perceived at the time and how they grew and how things have come to be the way they are and possibly decayed over time. Uh, well, one major point I wanted to pick out from what you, uh, you described was the intergenerational um, shift. I think from, as you said, yeah, from the 80s, from obviously the high culture to now moving to more uh, focus on hip hop. Uh, I, I think that is quite significant because the generation before were the ones who just came uh, post Black Panther, post uh, Martin Luther King and, and the marches and fight for uh, uh, civil rights from the 60s. Those were the people who potentially had a more African-centered or centric uh, out outlook or, or perspective. Um, but following from the 80s, and this is my, my opinion, following from the 80s, that has changed somewhat. It's become more of a uh, potentially self-centered view now coming from the culture of, say, hip-hop and R&B and the younger generation who um, didn't or uh, no longer pursued um, their parents' uh, agenda, so to speak, because perhaps there was no direct need to, there was more of a self-centered uh, uh, focus of getting money because a lot of hip hop then was, uh, came from a lot of young people being able to pursue money and not, and then obviously there was also the introduction of dr um, drugs into um, communities at the time, which also caused, caused further decay with, with, with drugs and, and drug wars and, 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 and things like that. So I understand that that perspective, and I think it's a very significant one because I've always said that I think this generation um, don't really have a, an African-centered viewpoint or agenda. I don't think there's any kind of movement right now. I mean, the most popular movement in the U.S. is Black Lives Matter. Um, but I don't think there's any significant move. I mean, we have other ones like the Black Israelites, the Noapians, Black Hebrews, and all those other groups, and then even the Nation of Islam. But I don't see any group that has an agenda 
focusing or facing Africa, either for return, either for engagement, either for um, uh, collaboration or cooperation. I haven't seen that group emerge. And, and, and this is obviously stark contrast to the 60s and the 70s. So I think there lies, we are now seeing the bottom end today. Right. DVDs now thirty and now we're having a purpose for Africa. Now in and now uh, having to inter uh, interrelate with people from the continent and vice versa, and to discover what purpose of this interaction is. Um, um, everyone having their own views about what they are, where they are, where they're from, and not having to back down or concede or even entertain any kind of um, concessions in the ideology. And that's what we're having now. I think some part was lost, and I will speak also on uh, on the side of, of, of Africans. I think they're more so, it didn't even really exist. They saw their leaders who came back from the U.S. in... in um, uh, Nkrumah, uh, Zikwe and Co. They saw their leaders and they they followed those leaders and paid reference to them. To them, I don't think and what Namdi was saying that um, that no one gave paid acknowledgement or homage to the universities or schools that allowed those people to come and study. I don't think that would have been anyone on the continent's um, um, issue or or they would have had have had a need to do that. They, they focused on the leaders who came to bring the message to them, but they didn't know the background of that, uh, of the fact that they studied in these universities or have, or the need to have any kind of uh, sentiment towards that. Their only focus was the leaders in front of them and the message they brought. It was not significant. So it would take, it would take certain groups to pick up on that to say, pay homage to where they got the idea from to our, our, our colleagues, our comrades over there, but it wouldn't have been a, a message for the masses. I, would, I wouldn't put any onus on the masses to do that. It, it, it wasn't their thing. It would take either a government of the time or a certain group or maybe the families of those people to promote this. But the people there just came from colonization. They had these leaders there. They Revered them, think they would go back to look at where they studied and things like that. Except those leaders themselves brought that message with them and spread that message about where they got their message from. If they didn't do that, then why would the people know to do it in themselves? So that's that's that, that's what I think. Now, I mean, with regards to that, that, you can't put that on 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 continental African people for not knowing. Um, not paying homage to the, the likes of, of, of those, um, it, it, even up to the case of Black Panthers, they wouldn't have known about that. It was not their fight to know. They didn't okay. know about it. It wasn't taught. It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't in the educational system. It wasn't in. Um, it wasn't in, in media. It was just non-existent. No, but, th but see that. That's why I'm saying is what, what what you're saying is right. They wouldn't have necessarily known about that but that's but see i don't believe that that's where the exactly the breakdown has occurred i think that um not knowing enough about each other is a problem but i was trying to set a uh, context around the vacuum so if you would permit me i want to just throw a couple of things in in support and and insertions into the dialogue you just kind of ran through okay late 1960s early 19s through night early 1970s black power movement okay now what we're we talking about about the black power movement we're talking about the creation of kwanzaa to um you know create a holiday is based upon first fruit celebrations in Africa 
getting you know African American people to think more critically about blackness, about Africa, uh, and about the interconnections between us and the United States and the wider African diaspora, plus the promotion of um, you know even wearing African clothing as an example. Also encouraging colleges to have black studies, Africana studies, Pan-African studies. These were all part and parcel of the components of the movement that affected, um, you know, the, the outgrowth of the black power movement. So all of these things were Afrocentric, you know, somewhat in, in nature, of which people were conscious about you know, the African history and trying to move in that direction. Okay, so so then the 1970s passed, and then now some of the um, emphasis on the Black Power Movement or some of the aspects that I mentioned has sort of faded a bit as more Black people moved into corporate America. So we start talking about the Black Power Movement coming on the heels of the civil rights movement. Then you have affirmative action programs, then people sort of move into corporate America and think they're sort of moving on up just when the, the uh, TV program, The Jeffersons, was, was on about the rise of black people moving from one economic level to another, okay? So some of the black power movement imagery sort of fades but in the mid to late 1980s, the Afrocentric movement sort of resurfaces in another form that I think kind of is an extension of the Black Power movement, in which now you have on lots of lots of college campuses, you know, um, a resurgence in uh, you know wearing of African clothing, being knowledgeable about what Africa is, the Im positive images of Africa. Even I can remember being in, in college, um, being a part of an organization on the a and campus called um, Students United for a Free Southern Africa, in which we, on the campus, built a model of uh, some of the shanty housing on the campus to, um, you know, give visible note to the kind of conditions that Bantu people were living in in South Africa under a racist of apartheid regime. So you had that kind of consciousness go going on. But what we have to remember is even 1980s and before, there were small, small amounts of African and Caribbean immigrants to the United States who were actually now making the United States a second home or, or a new home. So just at the time, say from the 90s onward, when you now start getting a larger influx of international black people who are coming to the United States to live, at this particular time frame, you then see the emergence of rap coming about, sort of like bad timing. Again, I want to mention, and I'm hoping this fits into the context and narrative that I'm saying, as well as what you have been saying, is that, you know, rap, even though some of the early rappers were conscious rappers that you know, we're talking about our history. I'm thinking of people like KRS-One who, you know, talked about the, the history and positiveness uh, of Africa and some of his early rhymes. Um, but some of the rap, most of the rap got started in northern ghettos in the United States. Didn't start down south. This is important because if you look at the 1970s, 1980s, there were a lot of entrenched ghettos in the northern cities of the United States. 
many of these cities, whether it be Newark, New Jersey, Detroit, areas like Chicago, where you had some riots in the 1960s that left some of these areas decimated, whites moved out of these big, some of these big city areas, leaving huge ghettos with lots and lots of poverty, and and there was no um, money being pumped into these areas to fix these areas up. So a lot of your core ideas about rap came about where you had lots of poor black people in these entrenched ghettos who said they wanted to create an expression for telling their narrative about what they would say see as life in the ghetto. Okay, they wouldn't have had the money at all to to spread rap. It was music moguls who were white people who saw a way for them to make money by basically mainstreaming low culture in the black community to be mainstreamed over the United States. And this began to affect how people talk to one another, the increase of using the word nigger all the time publicly, uh, how people saw authority, how people saw their parents, and in some cases create breakdowns in discipline at home and the way that black people projected themselves. It wasn't across the board, but it was enough uh, segments within certain cultural constructs of the African American community that as this narrative became broad brushed, African American culture became known synonymously with rap and hip hop, which if we can see the promotion of rap and hip hop came just about at the time that more and more immigrants, black people from Caribbean and African countries were coming to the United States. So large quantities of people from the continent who were coming to the United States, regardless as to what they thought about African American people upon coming or what they were fed in terms of propaganda were coming at a time in which the hijacking of African American culture based on a whole lot of positives was being broad brushed with negative aspects. And I think that this is a critical piece in terms of what we see now in terms of, you know, perceptions. And again, the African-American or the black population in the United States is at least about 50 million. So if we were to remove out, you know, African and Caribbean immigrants, which may be about 4 million out from that group, Let's say for round figures, let's say we got 45 million African Americans, we got 5 million, you know, immigrants and their children who are black. Um, I think that we have a lot of African American people who, you know, would be model citizens and would, you know, meet various African people halfway, particularly if we see that, uh, you know, a large proportion of people from the continent who are coming to the United States, you know, do have degrees, do have certain kind of economic status. We have that in, in the U.S. already. It's just that we're talking about more of a select group that's coming to um, the U.S. versus having everybody here in the U.S. amongst the African-American group so if we thought that 75% of the, say, African immigrants, let's say those are about 2 million versus the Caribbean, maybe another 2 million, but let's just say of the African immigrants. So let's say we had, um, let's say we had a million and a half, as an example, of the African immigrants that were well-educated, 
uh, we're middle class, we might have 25% of the African American population that's already here that may have those same type of um, those same type of stats. Okay. And so, therefore, we might have about over 11 million African-American people to have the exact same socioeconomic profile as, in the example, the 1.5 million African immigrants. Okay? So, we've got, you know, competitive groups. We just have some areas of negativity that get broad brushed. And I think we just have to keep that in mind. Let me just say that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I hear that, and, and that, those those are very valid points. Um, I, I still I still feel though that even in saying that the the general sentiment um, is one of of distance, uh, and no 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 matter how much interaction is happening now it seems that um there is a there's a barrier and a lack of understanding um and 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 you know some some african americans saying things like um they want to go back and help or, or they might want to go back and help you know words that might be perceived as condescending or being used go back and help africa um, rather, rather than use the words collaborate, use the words uh, cooperate. Uh, um, I mean, those then, are different issues, though. Those, those aren't those different? I thought we were talking about. Let me see. Make, 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 sure, make sure I can understand here. So when you mention about that part, that that's that isn't that something different than why there is a a, a clash. I mean, I can I can get into addressing why people are saying they want to help, but is that is that going to be a source of why there will be clashes based upon the rhetoric that you hear now? No, no. Uh, well, well, we're not we're not, we're not just talking about the, the sources of the clash. We're talking also. Uh, well, we talk about the sources as well, but also in the clash when the interaction is is ongoing, um, how the the conversations are being held, how the messages are being delivered and being received on either side, as it as it happens over social media, over the internet, textually, sometimes visually, but not in a real like you're not going out to, to a restaurant to have a meal or going to watch a movie or take your kids over to somebody else's kids. This is just impact like this right now, speaking to you, speaking to me, a message being sent across and maybe not enough time for it to get resolved, uh, not having the knowledge as you're talking about, uh, about the history of how things have come to be. And it's good that you're going through them now because some people wouldn't have that context. Some people who are in the late 20s or early 30s won't have that context because they've just grown up in a society, as you said, post 80s, where they don't really know about what happened before. Uh, they're just facing the now. And now it might just be what can I get for me? Not not knowing the need, not having the need to pay any homage to anyone, or or pay reverence to those who have fought for uh, anything in the past. And this applies to people on the continent as well. This is what I'm trying to say: that speaking on both perspectives, and even on an African perspective, that the the most heard allegation I've heard uh, has been. That when Africans come over to the U.S., they don't integrate. That's been the thing, and I just need to ask: How would that even be? How would well, integration take place? Well, let's just start right, right there. That's why I said we got to take these points, I guess, piece by piece. Now, mm -hmm. I can deal with that point, or I can try to deal with the thing about the, the, uh, you know. Uh, Want to go to Africa to help? Which which one would you like me to start on? Um, start, start, start with the go to Africa to help, and then talk about the integration, and then then not forget we'll also talk about um, like this this petition is ongoing about about a 
actors or our actors taking jobs in general in the in the US, African all right. actors. All right, just 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 remember all those points. Okay, I'll try to do the best from my perspective to to uh, to delve into these sentiments. Okay, well, first of all, most African American people are somewhat based in the United States, as in not necessarily traveling as much to the continent in general. Um, some might be lack of exposure. A lot of it has to do with economic resources to go, you know, to go um, b back and forth. Um, it should be said that the United States overall has a low percentage of people who have passports. And I think that's because in general, in the US, it's not presented as you need to really travel the world because supposedly everything centers around the US, you have everything here and everywhere else is not as up to par. I think those are untrue uh, stereotypes uh, you know, in general, but that's some of the, um, I think the, the bigotry, if you want to use that term, that has been inculcated as a general trend of thought within the U.S., and certainly African-American people have a low percentage of people who have passports and all like that, though more and more African-American people are, are definitely traveling, you know, outside of the United States, even if it is in terms of, you know, like cruises to the Bahamas and to places in the Caribbean. Okay. Now, ha having said that, uh, the perception about helping Africa comes from, I think, a couple of places. One is, I think, Lots of African American people feel like Africa is their original homeland and they would like to do what they can to help because they see or they think or perceive that Africa is in dire straits. Now, now um, you know, the images that are sometimes given on television and in literature that, you know, lots of people are starving and people are poor, um, that no matter uh, what the uh, socioeconomic condition of somebody living in the United States, black or white, that, you know, that uh, people for the most part on the continent are living in, in, in squalor, you know, seeps into people's minds. That's one. Certainly the images of Africa has not been being infrastructurally developed per country there are always exceptions, is um, is the case. So they feel like they want to, you know, help in some way. And the emergence of various African peoples from the continent who are moving to other countries, whether it be Canada, UK, EU countries, United States, Australia, makes people in the U.S. feel well, they're coming to the U.S. and these other countries because opportunities are less in African countries where they're coming from than in countries that are predominantly white that are considered industrialized. And so people are thinking, well, if African countries were better socioeconomically uh, and in other sorts of ways, people would stay in those countries. So um, if we were to look at the US, for example, it was a large exodus of people living in European countries in the uh, mid 1800s, late 1800s, early 1900s, that felt like they needed to flee from different uh, European countries. Either the economy was bad, fascism, all kinds of things, and they would come to the United States as a beacon 
for white people to come from all over the world to blend into the U.S. as a general Caucasian uh, for the purpose of creating a, you know, a better life. So the trickle of Europeans or the U European flow dwindled and dwindled down as the 1960s approached because the economies in Europe increased so there was no real need for massive amounts of Europeans to come to the United States seeking a better life when they could basically live the same way in Europe as was perceived of living in the United States. So as the uh, civil rights uh, laws got put in place where at least on paper, Black people may not feel in mass that they had to be completely confined to menial menial jobs. Uh, they could rise in the U.S. with um, different acquisition of, of skills, etc. Then uh, I think that it's been shown that there was a thought that you the the U.S. Uh, immigrant floodgates would be opened a bit so that more so-called third world peoples or people who are hungry for a new life who are coming from impoverished countries could be brought into the United States to replace the, the automatic roles that the majority of African American people were forced to be under since the apartheid laws were being lifted in the name of, of civil rights. So therefore, into the U.S. came not more Europeans post-1965, but other peoples from so-called third world countries, inclusive of more people from African countries. So with that, the perception is, is that, you know, if people are coming to the U.S., it's because where they live is not very good. And that's the perception that lots of people from the continent and the Caribbean give to people in the United States and to African American people simply because of the, the zeal to come to the U.S and just by the presence of them being there. So African-American people feeling like, well, I want to move to Africa so that I can move to an African country so that I can be better off. There's no precedent in their mind for thinking that they'd be better off in an African country, um, regardless of the resources there when they see so many people from the continent coming to the United States with a le level of eagerness. And so African-American people are looking around saying, well, we're fighting for civil rights and fighting marginalization here in the U.S., but supposedly our life from a material standpoint is better off than what many people in African countries experience just on a monetary level in terms of what people make, even if they make minimum wage in the United States, African countries and people associated with the countries are not providing African American people with any other narrative other than African countries need help and maybe African Americans can can do something to help those countries if given a position to do put in position to do so because those countries don't seem to be able to to do anything for themselves. So now when we see here's China now giving all kinds of loans to African countries and um you know, that, that may not be sustainable for the African country to pay back and perceptions that China is going to recolonize some of these African countries as European countries had done. And we see lots of people leaving and fleeing 
from one country to another trying to get out. There's no way that, that people are thinking that African countries, that the leadership of African countries is any good. There's just, there's just no way. They're not giving anything, any, any idea. It's like, it's a mess. What are these people doing? Are they idiots? And that somebody needs to help them. So that's that's the reason for you know for for that. Now, if African Americans saw that lots of people from the continent were coming to the U.S., staying for just a little while and going back, like in the time of time of Kwame and Chroma, then and then building the continent to a certain level that resources were being used adequately and then people from the continent said well hey this is what we're we're building right here and people could see all the progress you know under african tutelage not china building all the res uh, building the infrastructure then maybe african american people might say wow wow if you're going to treat, if we're going to be treated disrespectfully in the United States, perhaps there's a better life in an African country and we can see the, um, we, we can see the results of it. In fact, sometimes, uh, you know, Nambi said at the very beginning of the program, he said, well, certainly um, I as an African American people person might hear various things that people say to each other. Well, I want to mention one, and this is sometimes a joke that some people have told. The joke that some people um, have told is that if lots of African-American people were to leave to get on a plane um, to go to Africa, to go to various African countries, they have to wait a long time for um, the, the plane to become empty to take them to Africa because there'd be so many Africans who be trying to get into the United States until they would hold up African-American people trying to leave to go over there. So that in a nutshell, um, you know, I think is why a number of African-American people may feel the need to want to help the continent because the images are so so bad of the continent, sometimes lack of exposure, and because they wonder, well, why are so many African people coming to the U.S. if Africa was better? Just in the same way as white people in the U.S. believe that European countries are doing good because of the infrastructure that they see, and also, they don't see a mass uh, exodus of people from Europe today that are coming to the United States. Well, I, I know a lot of situations have been, you know, bastardized at the point of the conditions drowning in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, yes, yes, th those are all facts, but I, I think the, the uh, approach, if that is the one that you've painted, would be one been tempered with, with some sort of uh, uh, introspection because that, that's that would be very reactive, you know, everyone has issues. Um, some worse than others, and if if that is the view, then someone from the African continent would would would, would this is why I feel some of them take it very grossly by hearing the, that word help, because they would look on the other hand and see um, what Africans, African Americans are subjected to, takes. and would then say, okay, why not just come back over here? 
Instead, why, why be subjected to that, not be able to resolve it, but then want to offer help to, to, for another situation that they wouldn't really know much about other than what they've seen on, on TV? That it would make more sense to cooperate, collaborate, you know, to leave, or at least have an option to leave that situation and take themselves out of that situation. At the same time, partner and collaborate to create a society dealing with the issues that Africans are going on, uh, experiencing on the continent, rather than what is perceived now as a a more condescending approach or look to say, you're going through so much, let's come help you. Because every, every, the whole world also sees the issue. No, but that's, but see, what, I, that's what I'm trying to say to you, that's what, I, that's what I'm trying to say to you, that that, that, that sentiment about the, the thought of African-American people wanting to help the continent, I don't, I don't perceive, I could be wrong, but I don't perceive that that is a major issue of consternation because the people from the continent who are coming to the U.S. a lot of times say that they're coming because conditions on the continent weren't that great. And they're glad to be in the U.S. So when African American people say they want to help, well, a lot of the people on the continent say they want to help too. That they, that that's the reason that they're coming to the U.S. is to uh, either stay because things are are bad in in certain African countries, or to use what they can get here to go back and help. So I don't I haven't found many people to you know, find it on a front for African-American people to say, to, to help. What I think has been a, a, a real problem has been, you know, the notion that, that, okay, how has Africa been, you know, portrayed, you know, and, and, you know, in general. And I just have found that that uh, so, so, now some some African peoples, I just in terms of perception, I get feel ashamed that it appears as though they're coming from an African country because the African country is not what they want. So they might try to boast to. African American people, well, this is Ghana, this is Nigeria, and this is who we are. And then African American people feel sometimes put upon because they think that the African person is thinking that they're better or they're talking down to the African American person, like, oh, you people don't have any particular culture. Let me show you what being an African is about, or you're not as much of an African as I am. And then the African American person might be like, "Well, wait a minute. All right. So since you're coming to the United States, you're not going to disrespect me here. If you think that the African countries are so much better, or you think that you're better because you're an African, why don't you go back there? See, that's where that idea comes about. Um, because sometimes I think people feel a certain kind of way." that they're in the United States, but they're trying to make African countries that they may come from seem like they're great places. And some African-American people in heated discussions or not knowing someone's agenda see that as a contradiction. I mean, they, they do, they see that as a contradiction. They're like, well, why don't all these Nigerians and Ghanaians and Senegalese and Kenyans and these people, uh, you know, go back to the countries that they are from and build and build those countries up. So, if, well, well, if you were I, to, I think, I think there'll be a simple, simple answer to that. I mean, in the UK, I'd say the immigrant population, this is by census figures, would put black people, and that means from different 
countries, about 3 million, give or take. Now, that's like a drop in the ocean for the population on the continent, going towards a billion. So the perception would be wrong to think that people are just fleeing in such huge numbers as to depopulate the, the continent. It's just those, most of the time, who are privileged enough to be able to even get 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 the amount to get the plane ticket to even make that venture a journey to try and make their family's lives better and they're usually taking care of a larger number of people back home so it's not it's not uh, up until recently with the mass migrations to libya and that really is because of the breakdown of libya and and, and the, the the advantage or, or, or the possibility of them crossing the border if if libya didn't break down that wouldn't have happened it no, would have happened. People, people have been using the traditional means or the other parts to better their lives. That's, that's what would have happened. So the right. Libya thing makes it look like as if it's a perennial thing that we were all doing all the time anyway. No, Libya intervention was by the West. And because of the breakdown of Libya, it created this avenue for people to actually do that. And people started telling others, learning about it, and started flooding. But that wouldn't have happened because it's never happened previously in our history no but the libya the libya thing is a recent piece um that's been you know highlighted about the exodus of people from different african countries trying to go through libya and other places in north africa to get to europe it's, it's been projected that way but i'm talking about overall see you mentioned that Look how big the continent is in terms of population. You know, over a billion, over a billion people, right? And so you're saying, well, you give me an example. You're saying, okay, well, if you look at black people overall in in the UK, you would say there's three million, and obviously out of that three million, all are not coming from African countries. Some are coming from Caribbean countries, also, right? So your your point in yeah. saying that is that the perception is is that uh, that you know that the less than three million people who would be immediately uh, African immigrants in their families would be a small proportion of people from the continent. So how would that even be rational to make it seem as though everybody is trying to flee? The the idea. From the African American perspective, I think, is that it's not that there's only a small number of people from the continent who are in the United States versus the number of people that are on the continent. It's just that the idea that that the ones who are coming here are the ones who could get here. But if you opened up the floodgates, uh, that lots and lots and lots of people, millions and millions and millions of people will be coming from the continent trying to get out. That that's that's the idea. Uh, now now whether that's true or not, it has a perception that it is true because the ones who come to the U.S. to live or the U.K. or Canada or whatnot, people don't perceive that they want to leave to go back to these particular African countries, but that they would rather stay in the Western Hemisphere and maybe give remittances back or go back from time to time, but basically they can set up shop in the U.S. and other European places because life is better, amenities are better, infrastructure is better, and they'll just be better off and that they're lucky that they can leave. Now, even though you may say, well, maybe that's a false idea that African Americans have, but a lot of people from the continent who are in these places, they kind of give that same, you know, impression. So therefore, it would, I think, it would kind of make some African American people, depending upon their slant or the conversations I'm trying to trying to contextualize conversations that I hear would be like, okay, well, African-American people are in the United States 
and for whatever reasons that we've been cut off from a connection with a particular uh, African country or set of African countries, we stood up boldly to fight apartheid and white people in the United States, and we're still here fighting and stuff. Why is it that people from the continent leave their countries and come to the United States while they just stay and fight whatever negative conditions there are in in those particular African countries and make it better for people who are there. Now, you can see why, based upon the conditions in South Africa, why there was a kinship between African Americans and the ones in South Africa. This hopefully will relate also. The apartheid structures were similar. So African Americans identify with people in South Africa for that reason. And also, um, because of the struggle to end apartheid, we can sympathize with the vestiges of white supremacy that still exist in the country, even though apartheid on paper and the laws of apartheid have been removed. So to such an extent, the various people have said, well, in terms of kinship, the African-American population and the South African population of Bantu peoples there are very much akin and can kind of understand one another. In fact, it is true that the African-American populations in the United States were one of the most vigorous populations that spoke out to the world and massive protests in the United States to try to end um, apartheid in South Africa to the best ability that we could do. Now, the one other piece is there is sympathy of African-American people in some circles regarding how South African black people feel about immigrants from Nigeria and Somalia and Malawi and other places, Nigeria, coming into South Africa. It may feel like, hey, okay, we fought the white people in South Africa about apartheid. And now we're trying to get our piece of the pie and take back what's ours. And we don't want to see Nigerians and Ghanaians and other kind of people coming, mooching on to what the South African blacks are trying to get. Perhaps they're wrong-headed in thinking this, but it still rings in parallel to notions that some African Americans have that they're living in a Euro space in which they're marginalized. And here come Nigerians, here come Ghanaians, here come Kenyans and other and, and Jamaicans and all these people. And they feel marginalized in this country, feeling that there's a pecking order and a preference that white people would have for, uh, for, for these other newer groups of African people against the ones that's already been indigenous. So, okay. the same thing, look what's well, happening in Af South Africa about the same thing. So when I, when I visited South Africa, I remember talking with a white dude in a bar who came up to me and uh, you know who I was, but, uh, you know, introduced myself. I don't remember the context, but you know, he said, "Okay, f from the U.S." The very first thing he and I had to get him straight. The very first thing he said, he said, "Yes, he blacks. They don't want to vote." And I had to get him straight about the fact that I identified with black people in South Africa and that I saw white people as people who take from African people and create all kinds of apartheid and racism onto black people. So 
What if <laughs> I went to South Africa and whites were still largely in charge, but black people were given affirmative action programs and I somehow or another could not really understand hmm, what the black people in South Africa were going through. And I would always find myself in a position in which I would always be a mouthpiece for white people in South Africa about look, look, look at the black people in South Africa. They don't want to do anything to help themselves. So I can see the, the parallels, you know, in general. And so that tells me that if you're going to another country, in this particular case, in our scenario, people from the continent who are coming to the United States, who most of them are educated, a large portion of them, but who have access to the internet, to finding out about what's going on, should make the kind of effort to find out more about African American people and seek to operate with them before you come into a new country. But okay, they okay. all I mean, are dealing with white people on a better level. I would not step foot in Nigeria if I plan to live there or Ghana or no other place unless I was trying my very much best to to find out about what's going on and find out more about the people. But the idea here is, is that when you're coming into a space like the United States, you need to find out more about how white people than about how black people are because black people don't have any real power and that's what people are vibing on. And so therefore, people from the continent who have negative views about black people here for varying reasons and varying degrees uh, feel like, may feel like that somehow African-American people are people they may need to not have heavy association with, but it's best to figure out best how to get along with white people than it is your own black brother and sister that you may have been separated from by oceans and time. Okay, I'll ask a few questions and I'll give some comments. Where, what is the spread geographically of African Americans in the United States? North or South? Well, um, since you since you broke the United States up south like that, roughly, roughly, it's about fifty percent that live in the north, and about fifty percent that live in the south, with now increasing amounts of people moving from the north to the south for varying reasons, economic reasons, uh, cultural reasons, etc. that's actually the percentages so that there will be more percentages of black people who live in the south than in the north. But if we were to look at 1865, over 90% of the African or black population in the United States live in the South with emptying okay. populations that occurred from really the 1870s all the way up through the mid 1950s of many people thinking they could escape Jim Crow or felt like there were, you know, better economic uh, conditions that actually evened out the population 
you know, moving, you know, in the South and North and even the, the West uh, of, of the country. And so over time, as I said, um, numbers of black people thought they should move to the North, but what they found is they found levels of segregation there and also some limited opportunities and many of them got stuck in ghettos that were entrenched with all kinds of poverty. So that in fact, many blacks thought they were better off in the North against their relatives and family that still lived in the South. But in fact, in some ways, black people were better off in the South with some hindrances and then in some cases, there may be advantages in the North, but really not any better off overall. In fact, the South today may have, in fact, more opportunities for Black people. And that's why many Black people are moving back from the North to the South after having been up there for 50 years. Okay, the, the reason I asked that is because I'm now trying to because obviously I haven't migrated to the U.S., but I'm trying to break it down for decision-making in, in choice locations and why. So if you said it was a 50-50 split north and south and progressively the people, uh, African Americans are moving from the north to the south, um, so say so we'd, we'd call it now, I don't know, say, say less for argument's sake, call it 60-40, 40% in the north, 60% in the south, as it's progressively moving southward then what is the spread would you say for the i guess industrialization north and south would you find many more companies uh f f or industry in the north than in the south well um well you could find more industries but more companies are relocating to the South and building additional um, operations in the South. So a number of African-American people that are moving from the North to the South or who are choosing also to resettle in the South are actually a number of educated black people with college degrees and special skills who are moving to um, certain um, Southern cities in, in the South like Dallas, Texas, Memphis, Tennessee, um, Nashville, Tennessee, Houston, Charlotte. So um, there is a migration, a remigration back. Okay. See, see, see I'm, I'm trying to look at it from a migrant's perspective. And the brain drain in Africa. The brain drain the late 70s, uh, 80s, when pretty much across the continent there were military dictatorships everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that was the main driver of massive brain drain. There were military dictatorships, suppression of civil liberty, liberties, um, no progress, no industrialization, no transformation. It was a standstill of of, of, of Pro, pro, pro progress across the continent. So those with the means, the knowledge, know-how, expertise, degrees moved out into Europe and the United States. Now, those people, when they moved out, naturally they would have moved to places where they Now, from the sounds of it, from places of lack of industry would not be a choice. They only be able to move to be able to cater for their expertise. And if that is the case, it sounds like it would, be, it would have been predominantly the North area that had less black people and predominantly places that would offer them avenues to apply their trade. Now I'm trying to look for the genesis of these things i try to hopefully explain to viewers in my mind and how this wasn't a conscious decision to segregate that this was a 
Um, I'm not saying segregation like that. That's not segregation like that. It's moving where the opportunities are. Yes. That, 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 that's what I'm trying to say. So, so, so. So, so they are large. So what I'm trying to say is they are significant. Like, for example, there are significant Nigerian uh, community in Houston, Texas. There are significant uh, uh, communities of different kinds of African peoples in the Washington, you know, Washington D.C. area, or, or or in New York. So segregation does not mean that you don't go to a city that has necessarily <clears throat> large amounts of African American people. It doesn't mean segregation like that. Though I will say that there are pockets of, of African immigrants that do live in places in the United States where there are very few black people in general, like in Minnesota and Denver, Colorado and places like that. But some of these people have just moved there. And, you know, like I told you one time, um, you know, people who are from the Somali Bantu uh, groups that were airlifted to various places, found themselves being relocated um, to different parts of the United States in areas where they generally weren't that many, um, you know, black people. But when it came to, you know, like people from Ghana and Nigeria and stuff, you can find, you know, large communities of these particular ethnic groups of, or national groups of African people in places like DC, Atlanta, Chicago, Houston, Texas, Dallas, Texas. So it doesn't mean a segregation like that. So when you when you mention the term segregation, I'm more so thinking in this context, meaning that you might not have that much interaction, even if you're in the same city. Do, do you see yeah, what I'm saying? So, okay, yeah. Texas has a lot of black people, you know, but but it doesn't mean necessarily that the I don't know the circumstances there, but it doesn't mean necessarily that the Nigerian community that's in Houston necessarily interacts a lot with uh, African American groups. They they may, but you use the words segregated, so I was thinking that you had in your mind some type of situation where there was no not much contact. Yeah, well, well, yeah, this is what I'm trying to say. This has been some of the allegations that constant African people, when they go to the U.S., they, in turn, means they segregate, they don't integrate, uh, they tend to stay on their own or prefer to stay with white to white hands the team banded about quite a lot. Um, other instances obviously pay homage and reverence. I'm just trying to show that in many instances, this these allegations could be. Could be. Can you hear me clearly? Now I can a little bit better. Okay, yeah, I said, and I'm just trying to give credence to the rebuttal that Africans from the continent go with a mindset of not have not integrating or those around and dismissing the, the gains made by what I'm trying to say is for someone who given the context of leaving their countries in a brain drain which is pretty much against their will it was some of the instances of war war, uh, military dictatorships, sometimes genocides. People left en masse with a brain drain, those who could, to move out to the new world, so to speak. So it wasn't incumbent on those people to, as, the, as a priority, to go and start to find, um, seek camaraderie. They were just basically going to restart their lives in some instances, some seek new pastors to start again and to be able to help those who couldn't come over with them. So that that's why I started the whole thing saying by by saying it's a bit unfair to those making those allegations uh, that Africans are not making an effort. 
that, that that's a picture I'm trying to paint because we're talking about worlds colliding and, and the different uh, uh, um, misunderstandings that have come as a result of people not knowing the background. Um, so, so I think it's just worth noting that clearly that this, this is what I see here in the UK with Caribbeans. There were two, two waves of those who came over here. The first wave came to study. Mm -hmm. It came to study in the 70s and 60s, and then they left. The second wave came back towards the end of the 70s, early 80s, to stay. The Caribbean primarily has been here from the 50s. I mean, there were Africans who came in the 50s as well, but came and left, came and left. But the Caribbean has been here from the 50s. Um, they came on Windrush, um, ship, and, and afterwards, mainly after the World War II, to come help rebuild. They needed workmen, craftsmen, carpenters, plumbers, technicians, electricians to come help in the society. So they brought workforce predominantly. Whereas Africans in general, I have to speak for Nigeria anyway, came to study, Ghanaians too. So, so it was a different way. So the Caribbean now also has some kind of, there's a friction between both. And I think it stems from the same thing. One feels they were there before, they had to fight with the existing indigenous people, the white Europeans, white Americans, they fought for their rights and people came and benefited from it. But you cannot blame those who came afterwards for, because it wasn't their fault. It wasn't their fault that they came and they, they are now in this city that has some freedom that they can enjoy. It is not their fault. Uh, and and that, that's what I, something I would hope that people would stop alleging. I mean, there might be other things now that can be clearly to the African population and on the other side that have clearly been done or not done. But I think that one is one I'd like to just hopefully this come and have not made the effort. I just think that given the context, there is no precedence in a way for that to happen. No active organization, group or body to say, when you arrive and come together, there have been individual people who've come and met up with leaders of, of communities and then formed a bond and then proposed a way forward. But when it comes to economic migration, that, that that really can't be a that, that can be a kind of onus, I would say, on them. So that's well, I don't see like in this country, in the US, I don't see much um, friction in terms of conversation that I hear between people in various Caribbean communities versus the people in the continental African community. So like, it's like each one of these communities, you know, may have their own community and may have limited interaction with other communities. Um, maybe they come together on certain um, allied interests, but see, it's, that's not really the, that's not really the problem that's not really the problem that the that the that the communities are 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 separate and they're not just all blended together or that they're distinct communities the perception is is that the african american community overall in the way that people would envision it is not doing well it's not that the african american community is separate from another community or that the Nigerian community or the Ghanaian community, you know, shouldn't be separate. It's that the African American community is not doing as well. And the perception is that these other peoples from these other groups that are also black are taking advantage of opportunities that should go to African American people because it's perceived that the structure of the country is in the hands of white people and white people are, are giving African, giving uh, uh, Caribbean and African immigrants preference over African American people. 
It's not the fact that they're separate. It's, 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 it's preferences. Okay, but, 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 but then, but then this, this, if that's the case, then this, this cannot be attributed to the, the actual migrants themselves, can it? No. No, see, what I'm saying is, is that the grievances that African Americans have, um, are grievances with the the system in, in, in the U.S. and some African Americans feel as though if you didn't have the African immigrants or Caribbean immigrants, that that would somehow make white people be forced to give more leverage to African American people because you wouldn't have other go-to people uh, in general. So, as an example, so so I, I, are, you, are you then saying that that what what what's happening is African Americans are lashing out at Africans as a result? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Because because the the drum up of the rhetoric, you know, sort of um, makes the. Uh, many African Americans see immigrants who are black negatively, even more negatively in some ways than other people like Hispanics who are coming, because they're like, okay, well, Hispanics may not be, uh, you know, they may have their issues about discrimination, but they'll eventually blend in as being Caucasian. But <clears throat> black people are going to be in this particular boat constantly and other kind of black people who are coming to the country um, will be taking advantages away from African-American people as white people create preferences within the, within the black group. Kind of like in the same way as I mentioned in, 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 you know, in South Africa, where we know that the whites who are there are responsible for apartheid and its construction but there's a dislike in some quadrants for nigerians and somalians and other kind of black people coming to south africa so the attention is off of attacking the white people for their still white privilege in south africa but the attack is on nigerians you see, so it's kind of like misplaced. So what I'm saying is it's misplaced in some ways in the United States as to some African Americans getting angry at, at um, progress or opportunities that some African and Caribbean immigrants have been afforded because white people are making the decisions about who gets what. So, so for example, when it comes to some of these Ivy League schools, Harvard and Yale, you know, it's like, okay, some people may feel like if Harvard said they were gonna have 500, uh, Let's just say, let's just say, five hundred uh, black students. We just call them black students. That if there were no Caribbean or African immigrants, that when Harvard said we're gonna make spots for five hundred black students, they would be forced to have all the five hundred as being from the so-called Af African-American group. But now that you have different kinds of black people in the US, that when, if Harvard said, we're gonna have 500 black students, that they can now not have to get African-American students as though they would have been forced to do previously because let's say, that they had 400 African-American students, then the African-American population can go 
uh, representatives and go to Harvard and say, see, you said you were going to have 500 black students. You've only got 400. So where are your 100 more? Where now, um, you know, Harvard can, can look and say, okay, so um, we have, we got, we got 500 black students. And then various African Americans be like, well, wait a minute now. Um, we thought you were going to have 500 African American students. And then Harvard in the scenario can say, well, no, we said 500 black students. African Americans are not the only black people. See, y'all were thinking that that African American equals black, but no, see, we deal with black, period. So then all of a sudden African Americans are saying, wait a minute, the other 400 slots are supposed to be African American students. In general, you only have 100 African American students. African American students are black people in this country. How do you have 400 additional black students but from other places? Then it becomes a matter of what well, Harvard said, well, wait a minute, African Americans, y'all are being bigoted now. You mean you want to discriminate against African people and Caribbean people who had higher scores than you to get in? We selected a number of them. You all shouldn't be protesting like that. Didn't Dr. King say to judge a person on the content of their character, not the color of their skin? And these are the kind of things that would make a lot number of African American people angry. And then the, the school can go back and say, hmm. Well, when we looked at various uh, high schools and test scores, you know, and, and where people are coming from, we found that these pocket of students, students who are Ghanaian Americans, students who are Nigerian Americans, students, we found a few of them from Zimbabwe and Jamaica. See, they had higher scores than you did. And then a number of African Americans said, well, wait a minute. You know, if, if, if Harvard and Yale are in the United States, then, and black people were slaves in the country and provided wealth to the United States, that also go, went for the building of these schools, then African Americans, regardless of their test scores, you should take the African American people and work with them even if they didn't have the higher test scores because other people who are not supposedly descendants of slaves should not have a preference in the United States just because they're black than the ones who are supposedly the descendants of slaves. My answer to that personally would be that they could make that argument but the white people created these schools for white people and they kind of make any kind of little rules they want. And that African-American people just got to realize that, you know, unless they made the highest test scores, white people don't believe in affirmative action. And there's no way that black people can make the white people believe in affirmative action. So if white people who built these schools regardless of if some of the money came from slave labor or not, decide to have zero black people or decide to have 50 African-Americans and the other 450 to be international, well, that's, you know, that's that. But that if African-American colleges exist, then the black people should go there. That, that That's that's what I, I, I really, you know, believe in. As African American people exist in the United States, and we're outnumbered in terms of policy, outnumbered in numbers, and in leverage, um, you know, as long as it's a white institution and white people created it, they can, um, they they're gonna have whoever they want in these institutions, whether it's fair or not, regardless of what uh, arguments that African American people make. So, so I can't blame a Nigerian student if they accepted a scholarship to a white school 
that gave them a scholarship, even if they overlooked an African American person, even if that may seem un unfair or not. Well, well, saying that, someone um, makes a comment. Uh, Cobb, thanks for for your comment, Cobb. You say, uh, and the question is to you. It says, don't you think um, African Americans should try to reach out to African immigrants since they since the African immigrants would be new to the country, and the African Americans would would know how things work, how things are, and that way to be able to indoctrinate them and let them know about the 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 perils of of, of obviously the uh, the white indigenous people there. Uh, alerting them to to certain things, areas or whatnot, and this this goes to the point I think I made earlier in that when new immigrants come, there should be some kind of body of integration or in, in induction uh, into communities that they would preferably like like to get in contact with, or to just to know rather than to navigate these spheres themselves. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think that's true. I, I think, yes, I, I think on all fronts, there should be outreaches from African American groups and organizations to basically socialize, um, you know, people from the continent uh, and the Caribbean to sort of integrate them into the African American space, uh, you know, in general. That's why I do think an outreach about history and culture and interface is important. I do think that HBCUs should be used to export uh, history and analysis of African American culture into um, libraries and conversation pieces on the continent so that we know more about each other and to create those exchanges so that African-American colleges, historical black colleges, actually could be incubators for people in the United States, black people in the United States, knowing about, uh, you know, different events and peoples in various African countries. I definitely, I definitely believe in that. Um, I think that part of that question also has to take a look at the fact that it might be perceived that the immigrants who are coming to the United States may or may not stay in the U.S. and have some place to go. But what about African American people who feel stuck? See, that's that's the problem. That people from the continent and the Caribbean come to the U.S. and can benefit, you know, in whatever is in the U.S. But African American people don't feel like they have anywhere to go if they want to leave or get a respite or any kind of, uh, you know, leverage in general. So African Americans are not equal to black people who, who are immigrants. But I will say that when it comes to college and job opportunities, African American people have got to look at it this way. You got to strive to be twice as good, even if that seems unfair. Because unless you have your own thing, you are limited in this environment. So you got to be twice as good. So I think that if African American people want to increase their um, uh, numbers, at Ivy League schools or get scholarships there or get scholarships to colleges anywhere in the U.S. They're just going to have to be twice as good and make the grade and that they shouldn't try to get into or expect to get into schools that they don't make the grade. So if if white people want to bring Ghanaians into Harvard saying that they got in uh, either based on a that they wanted to bring them in, or they had higher test scores than the African American person. Then the African American person is just going to have to get the notion that they're just going to have to compete, despite racism. But I think that a number of African American people are brought up with the idea that um, the U.S. owes them. Yes, the U.S. does owe black people, but black people don't have the leverage to make white people 
treat black people fairly underneath the uh, underneath the positioning that the African American people are in. So they're just going to have to accept um, racism and do the best they can, or find a way to leave, or have some other other options. They don't have well, well, to make white people do whatever. So they should stop. They should stop <laughs> having so much faith in the notion that white people will treat them fairly simply because they protest that white people should should do so. You see, and and some 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 will disagree with you. Some will feel, I mean, I, I agree with you, but some will feel, and I've heard this said before, because I've made that 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 uh, suggestion, uh, or 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 um, I've made that uh, insinuation that it, it is a futile battle because uh, the powers that be will not yield. But, but then some have robustly um repudiated that, 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 that assumption and and have br almost branded me in a way as if I, I was a traitor from um working on behalf of of the enemy so to speak saying you know almost saying to retreat um this is the way it's been received and i, and I remember an exchange once with um this guy what's his name he's the creator of um of um Hidden, hidden colors. I've forgotten his name now. Um, I'm going to find it. Tariq Nasheed. Tariq Nasheed, thank you. And I'll be back. Yeah, I had an exchange with Tariq Nasheed on Twitter once where I was making, not in a, in a roundabout way, making this assertion saying that their future lies on the continent, whichever way that takes, either having dual citizenship or, or, or just, uh, and that it's, it's, it's no shame to retreat, to fight another day, to look at another option, a plan B, to try and find another way um, for, for, for this fight because what they're looking for will not be given. And I just had a bombastic response from him and his followers on, on, on trying to look at as if, again, try to paint me as some kind of coon or something and saying, um, um, is an Africa going through this? Is an Africa going through that? What are you doing in the UK? Uh, but basically, we just came, it kept coming, kept coming for two days. <laughs> I was like, wow. So, um, what I think is um, there has to be a plan B. And, and, and now, we, I don't know if you can, um, you can come in with what, what, what you said you saw recently on a, on, on a show, and then we'll get into that. You know, just specific, specific issues and instances, you know. Like I mentioned about the HBCU, we talked about um, Af um, Africans coming from the continent and forming, like, uh, trying to create, like, a tribe in the U.S. So you, you see some, some, some um, continental Africans who don't like to describe themselves as African-American. They describe themselves more as um, Kenyan American, Nigerian American, Ghana American. But if you tell them that, if you approach them and say, "Boy, you see African American," I say, "No, I'm not African American." So it's like the word African American is a word that some of these, um, what I call uh, continental Africans that are resident in the U.S. do not want to associate with. Um, okay, okay, they would, they would, they would associate with that word if African American in the context now meant them. So, if you had, let's say, there were no indigenous, I'm saying indigenous, black people in the U.S. whose grandparents, let's say, had been born in the U.S., okay. So what we had is we had Nigerians arriving. We had Senegalese arriving from different ethnic groups. We had Congo people, you know, assortment, you know, of Kenyans, Ugandans, everybody coming. And then there had to be a category that would place them in a group for um, census reasons, I'm talking about the census, 
uh, and also uh, for political affiliation, then they probably would be okay <clears throat> with the term African American if they wanted to emphasize that they were a new citizen. They might go with just African, but it would be an umbrella term because they would see themselves for political purposes and leverage being grouped underneath this, this one entity. But the reason that they reject this, as you mentioned, is because African-American is associated with black people who've already been in the United States that have, in some ways, a negative image as they perceive and a negative image that has been presented to them by, by, by white propaganda. So therefore, um, they distance themselves from the term African-American and then get into Kenyan-American and, and Nigerian-American and all these other hyphenated uh, Americans, now Jamaican-American and Guyanese-American Trinidadian American, but because of, because of this and because of some of the new backlash that is happening, then you've got the some segments of the African American community that feels that they should drop <clears throat> the term African from the name African American and just place it as Black American to do two things, to distinguish them from being an African because they hate the concept of Pan-Africanism. They don't think that's a correct philosophy. They don't feel they're connected to Africa. And they also feel that so it gives them some type of justice claim leverage to be able to demand um, fair treatment and uh, restitution for slavery if they distinguish themselves completely from the term African at all in, in the name. So if the term went to Black American, then there would probably be a number of people from African immigrant communities if, if Black American became synonymous with the black indigenous people, they probably would use the term African-American if it could be mandated onto people who saw themselves as Nigerian and Senegalese and Kenyan in the United States because there is a sentiment amongst some, and maybe it's over-propagandized, that the African-American population that's being called that are wrong for calling themselves African-Americans and that the new immigrants, Nigeria, Kenya, whatnot, are the real African-Americans and should be more properly named as such. But when the term African-American was coined in the late 1980s, again, this was part of the Afrocentric movement, that maybe they maybe the term was too broad. Maybe there should have been another name from our Bantu ancestry that was named to specify the group that was already in the United States at the time. But but during that time, the leadership who thought of the term African American and, and publicized it didn't really envision that there would be masses of immigrants from African and Caribbean countries that would come into the United States that would see themselves as distinct completely because of the you know significant populations coming who would see themselves separately than the African Americans who just wouldn't blend in so that we would eventually have African Americans then we have Nigerian Americans and we'd have everybody else. I think what they thought was that it would just be maybe a few Nigerian people, a few people from Jamaica, a few people from Ghana, and they would just kind of blend in to the African-American population so that when someone said African-Americans, yes, somebody might say that I'm from Nigeria originally, 
and I'm from Ghana originally, but they would quickly say, okay, I'm an African American too, not where you 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 ask a person, uh, look, uh, uh, you you an African American, the person says, no, I'm not an African American, I'm a Nigerian American. And somebody said, well, I thought that all y'all were black. No, 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 I see myself as a Nigerian American. Don't confuse me with an African American. That is the kind of stuff that makes a lot of African Americans angry because they see that they feel as though the immigrant groups are not just coming to the U.S. to be proud of their individual heritage, but they want to alienate themselves from African American people because of what they have been told or their feelings about them. And that causes part of the problem also where I guarantee you that any African-American person, we want to use the term African-American, that would move to Nigeria or move to Ghana or move to Kenya or any place on the continent, whether they gained citizenship, dual citizenship, or simply stayed there for a while as a permanent resident, that if someone referred to them as a Nigerian or referred to them as a Ghanaian or a Kenyan or as a Malawian or whatever the case may be, they would feel so happy that people thought of them based upon the national namesake of the country because they would feel as though they belong and would never turn up their nose that somebody thought that they were actually to be mistaken for an indigenous person in the country because that is the reason that they would have moved to the African country because they wanted to affiliate with being African in the national sense and were so happy to be absorbed. But when people from the continent and the Caribbean come to the United States and became a citizen, they are happy to be an American as they see it but, want, but it, some may want to distance themselves being African-American, and many African-Americans feel an affront to that. And I understand why. See, see I, I wouldn't look at that as, as distancing. So. I would look at it as maintaining their cultural history because it, 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 takes, it, ta it, it, it takes more. They don't mind being American. They don't huh? mind being American. That's what I keep trying to say. They don't mind being an American. They find no. it an affront to be an African American. No, no, no. If no. Americans were doing well, they wouldn't have any problem with being an African American, but they would also say that they're Nigerian also. Well. That's the way it is. I'm just trying to lay, lay it on you that the negative perceptions, this is why the negative perceptions. I mean, oh, 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 okay. I, I, I'll ask this. I'll ask this on on your census forms. What do you have on your census forms? What designations do you have on your census forms? Well, um, it's interesting. You should ask about. It's interesting. You should ask about census. Or, or not, not just not just census. Like any forms, you go to right. hospital, uh, right. wherever. Right. Um, right. Government, right. government forms. I guess right. for the demographic. Right. Well, that's why I'm glad you asked that question because there are different um, terms that are used in various ways. Like, for example, you can go to a census form and you will find, um, you know, African American slash black and now some people are asking that the word slash negro be put on there that hasn't happened officially but there have been protests in small quarters to do that now why i'm mentioning this is because you'll have like african american slash black and then there'll be a little note that says this refers to any people or peoples um, who finds that their original ancestry or ancestral ancestry is in sub-Saharan Africa 
or any of the black peoples that live in sub-Saharan Africa. So when you get to Caucasian slash white, they'll list uh, any of the people who find their ancestry in Europe, the Middle East, or anywhere in North Africa. Then you'll have Hispanic, you'll list maybe Hispanic, and then they'll have a breakdown for that group and have you to check off a box, like, you know, Cuban, Puerto Rican, Guatemalan, etc. And then they'll say, um, any person that has any ancestry in any Spanish-speaking countries, irrespective of race, so that a Hispanic person can be black, could be white, could be Asian, but as long as they spoke Spanish indigenously, they go up underneath Hispanic. So for Hispanic people, depending, they can check Hispanic, but also check off a particular racial category. So Hispanic is sort of merged into race, though it's a, a kind of a language and cultural identification. And then they'll have other kind of breakdowns too. So now what we have here in the US is that people are protesting from Middle Eastern backgrounds that they had automatically been put into the category of Caucasian. But what they want is they want to be taken out of the category of Caucasian and put down as a separate category of Middle Eastern. And what they're saying is they don't benefit from being listed as a Caucasian because they might be discriminated against because many of them are Muslim. So they feel like if they just, even though they're listed as Caucasian, they don't benefit from having the white label. So what they want is they want a different kind of preference programs that acknowledge their Middle Easternness to sort of buffer against the discrimination that they think they might get. Now that's on census forms, but then on employment forms, they may vary. So for example, on an employment form, they might not necessarily have Caucasian. They may have just white, and they might just have black slash African American. But then I've seen now some job uh, application forms that will say African slash African descended. It won't say black. So de depending upon whatever form you fill out, those are the listings. But on a practical level, the person from Africa will, would put down black slash African-American. But depending upon how they may be positioned, that may be a benefit for them in terms of getting a scholarship or being counted in a, politi a particular political group. But when it comes down to how they may interact with people at the job or just in the society, maybe they might just say I'm from Ghana. Or maybe they might just say they're from, from, from Nigeria or, or whatnot if it gives an advantage. So, so it's a complicated mix even in terms of how people are identified on various forms, employment forms, census forms, other kinds of, as you said, uh, you know, government-based forms. Does that make any sense at all? Yeah, yeah, no, it it, it did, it did. Um, but 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 um, again, again, see, I'm I'm just trying to look at someone who's who calls himself Ghanaian American as and trying to look through the lens of of, of both sides and how an African American would see that as an affront and how. A Ghanaian could make that an affront, or it could be an innocent descriptor for themselves in this new society, not, not being that, not, not want to, or they are ashamed of taking on that uh, title, so to speak, of African American. Again, African American is broad, talking about a whole continent, talking about people who identify themselves by not only initially their country, but sometimes by the ethnic group. So to put those aside and just adopt 
African American is almost like lying to themselves in a way. Um, okay. Would okay. that be a conscious, a conscious, uh, a cause of an affront? Um, here's an affront. Here, here, here's an affront, and the affront may not like when I said affront. Um, I know you know what affront means, but. When I said a front, I don't mean that someone did something in front of an individual person that was disrespectful, such as in the example you gave, mentioning about a Ghanaian American as an example, that the so-called African American person was with a Ghanaian person and someone asked the Ghanaian person uh, or, or, or said to the Ghanaian person, just grouped everybody and said they were African-Americans and the Ghanaian person said, no, don't call me an African-American, I'm a Ghanaian. Not, not in the front like, like that, like where it's a personal offense. But I meant a front meaning the, the notion or concept of scenarios that happen that someone in being told about a certain situation finds the circumstances to be in a front. Now here his would be could be an example. Like let's say that you had um, a student from Africa that graduated from a certain college in the United States or a certain set of colleges. And they were being, um, you know, they were trying to get certain jobs in the U.S. or whatnot based upon their, their, their resume. And they got some interviews with particular companies. that when the interviewer is interviewing them, let's say that person who says, who thinks in their mind they're Ghanaian American, I'm just using Ghanaian American, would have been somebody that was born in the United States. Now, why I'm making that, um, that particular note is because if they were born in Ghana, and, you know, then therefore, if they went to school in the U.S. and they were trying to get a job in the U.S., if someone interviewed them, the person who interviewed them would immediately know from their accent that they weren't necessarily from the United States. It's kind of like if I'm if, if I'm listening to you, I can tell that you are from someplace else just simply because of the British accent in the way that you may speak English, you see? So it's, 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 it's not that I would immediately know, well, I would know you from Nigeria based upon knowing you and, and knowing your name. But if I just heard you on the phone and didn't know who you were, I would know that you were socialized in somewhere, in some way, in one of the UK type um, type countries. Now you may tell me, okay, well I was actually born in the UK, or you may tell me I'm from Nigeria, or you might say, well I'm from uh, Uganda, or Ghana, or whatnot. But I know it's something associated with the UK because of the accent. So in the United States, you might have children of an African immigrant who is born in the US, but they may have an African name, but they speak with a US accent. So when the interviewer is interviewing them, the interviewer doesn't know whether the person 
you know, uh, was born in the United States or whether they just were an African-American that just had an African name. Because this is also a part of the mix about discrimination. So if an African-American person just has a solid European name, first name and last name, if they have a name like, let's say they had a name like John, John Frazier, then, you know, over the phone or just on their resume, if they didn't have any <clears throat> notables on their resume that denoted they were a black person, either graduating from a historically black college or any kind of organizations that were connected with African American, then some people feel like they may be able to fool an employer to just simply send in a resume in which the person's name sounds as a regular European name and nobody might know they're black and they may get a chance to get an interview and not have their resume thrown in the garbage can. Okay, now, what if the person has a name, like I said, John Frazier, and they're black, they may escape. <clears throat> but what if the person's name is hmm, Kareem Frazier or Quantavius Frazier, that people automatically know, oh, that's an African-American person already. So the per so the interviewer knows that's an African American person, whether or not they fill out an application or not, and put down black or not. So for some people, their resume may go in file thirteen or in the garbage can, depending. All right. Now, suppose the person's name was, um, you know, was say they had a name like Hassan. Otubu, then somebody says, hmm, well, I don't know. I mean, uh, I've heard some African-Americans have names like Kareem, Hassan. I don't know. It could be, you know, it could be somebody who just had an African name. And they say, you know, that the, the, the black people are getting into having African names now, or some of them, and some just have made up. Uh, African American name, and some have Muslim names. So then the interviewer says, "Well, I don't really, I don't, I don't, I don't really, I don't really know." Uh, or they may have a name like Kwame, see, as a Ghanaian name. So now, what if the kid is from a Ghanaian background in terms of their parents, but they were born in the U.S.? So the interviewer interviews the person, and the person speaks to the interviewer just like me. Well, the person who is the Ghanaian son or daughter of a Ghanaian immigrant, Nigerian immigrant, anybody from the continent, may want to make sure that the interviewer knows that they are like of Ghanaian heritage and parentage because they know that African-Americans are looked down upon and if they can start to distinguish themselves in the mind of the interviewer, mostly white, they might have a better chance of not only getting the job, but securing a better future for themselves because the interviewer might look at the person and say, you know what? I initially was probably going to wonder whether they were African-American, but they made sure that they mentioned that they were Ghanaian and, oh, okay, this person might have a different sort of mindset. Uh, they might uh, not be like the typical African-American person to think that white people owe them something, and it might be best if I just go ahead and hire them than hiring the African-American person whose name may have been Jahim or Hassan or Kwame or something like that. And so when African Americans hear about such ideas that, you know, because they know that white people look at that and think of people from the Caribbean and Africa, at least for now, differently than African Americans, then they feel like that is an affront because okay. somebody from the continent is coming and is taking advantage of the fact that African Americans are looked down upon. I, I also think we have to look at the the aspect of 
economics. I've always said uh, racism in many, many, many terms. Obviously, there's also historical and personal religious um, lenses you look at racism through, but a lot of it, I think, is also economic. I think as what happened in the UK when they brought in people from the East, they started undercutting the indigenous British population. And because of that, there was a growing sentiment of anti-immigrant uh, uh, environment that that group leading to them leaving the EU through the referendum that they had. So isn't it possible that also these um, new immigrants are paid less on, on, on the whole when they are being made offers, they're more likely, depending on how long they've been in the society, they're more likely not to, like African Americans would, to benchmark their salaries next to their white counterparts, most likely. And I think this also goes for perhaps the, the movie industry, the actors that they're bringing from the UK who don't really get roles when they come, what they would pay them would be less than what they would pay those in the in in the United States because they would be much more up in arms to benchmark themselves, getting their rights uh, addressed according to their white counterparts and raise hell if there's all sorts of um, injustices and in that. Whereas someone who's coming from another background would not necessarily have those ability on those things in a new environment. It could be undercutting them, not knowingly, but they as the employers. Yeah, all of that. I didn't hear that. Yeah, I mean, so all it, of it, it's breaking up a bit. So no, all, all, all of that can, all of that, uh, all of that can be true, um, though, though. As, as a population in the United States overall, African immigrants or families of African immigrants have more wealth assets than the collective African-American population. But again, we're talking about a larger population with all types of levels of income versus the African populations that tend to have higher levels of education. In fact, um, Nigerians in the United States um, surpass a lot of groups, um, you know, based upon, you know, wealth acquisition. But, you know, there are perhaps a lot of factors, uh, a lot of factors for that. Again, I think that if we took out, say, if we took the Nigerian population as an example, it always seems to go back to Nigerians because they seem to have the largest group in these different countries, but in the U.S. in terms of immigrants. But we would have to take out a slice of the African-American population that has similar education level and similar socioeconomic positioning and then compare them and I th think they would be fairly uh, competitive, compatible or comparable. But if you just kind of take the entire African-American population from top to bottom, then they're going to be have less uh, wealth in comparison to Nigerians because the Nigerian population, like most of the other African populations in the U.S. that's coming from the continent are, you know, select groups. Not everybody can get to the U.S. and have the the monies to do so. It takes monies to get here and stay. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's where it becomes a a problem. I I do think also that African Americans could do better with different spending habits um i think that segments of our community not all but segments have sort of like given up 
you know, and have some bad habits regarding spending views and values, which keep them at a impoverished level on top of the fact that you've got racism and marginalization. I think we could be doing a bit better, but this is the, the fallout from, you know, long periods of time in which you've got such a big population of which some of the populations just haven't been able to move into new sectors of thought and economic, uh, you know, empowerment. And some sectors have given up and it, therefore you see sources of, of, of disparity. But we do have substantial slices of people that are doing um, okay. Like we have large groups of people that are going to college, but not not as much as I would I would want. And I think that those kind of comparisons just don't sort of get made. It's kind of like you take the African immigrant population and you compare them against the overall African American population, when really you would have to take the Nigerian population or the Ghanaian population and then take a slice out of the African American population who have similar socioeconomic um, attributables. Let me put it that way. Okay, so 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 in, in in trying to then close, and what's what's the way forward? Because as, as the title we were talking about, with worlds collide, um, the the younger generation is how I like to end end it on the younger generation. How what 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 are the ways forward in, in this younger generation who don't necessarily have the same imperatives as their parents or grandparents with a focus towards Africa? Uh, trying to find their own way economically and having to deal with the uh, the social cultural impositions and the injustices in the United States, the disparities of um, of of, um, of uh, living conditions and areas and things like that on, on a large larger scale. Um, with this new reach out. Um, occurring over spaces such as Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, of people now bouncing ideas of what they think about each other, how they view, viewed each other historically, uh, what they think of the situations on either side of, of, of the water now, how can a synergy be built? Because it seems the useful exuberance and fixed ideas are uh, causing uh, a rift um, that could widen if there's no intervention, if there's no strategy in place for for kind of unified thinking or even a purpose. It is just a mere purpose as, as it's, it's a fun thing to do to engage the spark conversation with no direction or can it be harnessed to, to lead into a kind of new paradigm because this is a brand new moment that we, we are in. And there needs to be an action to utilize it for a particular direction because the next stage um, of, of, of our development could depend on this, this very moment. Okay, can you do me a favor, please? Can, do you have a piece of paper in front of you? Pen and yep, yep, go ahead. The, yep. the question in a nutshell that you just kind of asked me in general, could you write that question down, please? Just okay. in general. All right, the reason why I want you to do that is because before we end the show, I want to see can I address quickly an area that we didn't get to that you mentioned. And that was, you kind of mentioned earlier that African and Caribbean immigrants would come to the US for you know, a, a, a better life. Um, and you, I'm not sure the context in which you exactly mentioned this, but it's kind of like, you know, they need to be, what if they are made to be aware of, of you know, of, of racism that exists in the country, 
and other sorts of things, you know, as African Americans could sort of guide them, uh, you know, about that. Um, I'm not sure exactly of the question and context, but I'm trying to recall the sentiment and maybe my response will kind of cover what you had in mind. But I'm not sure that when these various black immigrants come to the U.S., that they're thinking that racism is going to be a permanent problem for them. I think that they feel like it's, you know, it can be overcome and they pretty much, you know, work hard. They can achieve the, in quotations, the, um, the American dream. Okay. So we've got eager people who are coming who don't feel as though they're going to be slowed down. But what you have in African American community, you've got vibrant thinking people also that you know are not going to let racism slow them down, even if they're marginalized. But you've got significant segments of the population that believe that they can't make it, they don't have the skills to make it, they're not going to make it, and that they get into a victimization mindset and sometimes the leadership of the black community um, for sometimes political reasons steers black people into thinking that there are no solutions other than to um, you know, fight for just civil rights, for empowerment, or that um, black people are victims play the victim game, okay? So there are segments of our community that believe that and act uh, accordingly. But I do think that more people from the immigrant communities who are new to the U.S., you know, they do hit the ball running, uh, you know, here in the U.S., and they don't feel like anything is going to um, slow, slow them down at all. So I don't think that they feel that racism is going to be a permanent problem for them, and they see it as a minor irritation, but they think that African-American peoples concentrate too much on being a victim or feeling that racism will hold us down, and they don't understand the, you know, the mindset of the African-American people, which may lead to some thoughts that the African-American person is lazy or the African-American person is um, thinking about racism too much or protesting or why don't they just work harder in school and things like that, okay? Sometimes those things can be fair criticisms, but again, as I said, there are significant portions of African-American people who do not feel as victims, who do not come from families that promote victimhood and who know that racism exists, but they got to be twice as good. But I don't think that the interaction between the types of African-American people that are moving on a positive trajectory intersects enough with African immigrant groups that are having contact and interface with them. And I think that too many African immigrants have a broad brush in the negative of the African American community based upon how sometimes the hip hop and rap culture and the stereotypes associated paint the entire community when that in fact is, is, is not the case of, of a broad brush. I thought I needed to mention that because that's some of the, the problem. We need better interaction with between African immigrants and African Americans who have something to offer each other rather than us, you know, seeing each other through the lens of stereotypes. Um, and the question about what to do in the U.S., is just going to be the same across the board for African Americans unless they have a reach out plan to Africa for
for resources. Because I think that the African and Caribbean immigrants who come, they're going to utilize, naturally so, whatever benefits they can get in the United States, along with whatever benefits they may have by being from another country. So African American people will have to figure out a way to get additional resources to leverage for themselves while they're in the United States so that no African person is more disadvantaged than another if they if they intend to stay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it is a disadvantage, though. I mean, like I said, it is a disadvantage for the African-American person to not be connected to an African country. That, that's, that's a great disadvantage because the African-American person is marginalized within the United States without any way of creating resources for themselves other than what they can generate. So like all the resources that African Americans have are things that we, despite all odds, try to erect in the US without help from any other countries. It's just purely been what we've been fighting in the US. And so Therefore, our existence is dependent upon internally what's in the U.S., of which most of the resources now obviously are controlled, by, you know, by whites, and that's that's where the the that's where the problem comes. So, if a person is from Nigeria or Ghana and they have dual citizenship, that means did they have some place that they could send money back home or or you know use money that they're making in the United States to help create businesses in Ghana that they can eventually move into if they decide to go back from the US to Ghana or 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 to Nigeria okay that that's an advantage that is a great advantage that may not be seen. So it's not just that you have a Nigerian engineering person in the US and you have an African American person in the US who's also an engineer and someone says, hey, you know, they're equal because they have the same amount of education. They're, let's say, they're doing the same job and they get paid the same amount. It's that the immigrant person has an advantage because of the citizenship connection to another country that provides all sorts of resources for that person if they can sort of make that work. And that's the advantage that the African-American person doesn't have. And that's why African-American people are overprotective or protective about seeing other people come into the country, supposedly taking away opportunities that are fragile at best in, in 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 the US. Do you yeah. have some question about that that thought? Because I don't hear that what I just said is I don't hear that being um you know articulated you know very much but we've got to find the connections though and if we're talking about colleges and infrastructure, African Americans would have set up infrastructure that benefits Africans and Caribbean people that come into the US. In fact, the struggles of African Americans has actually helped other kind of people, whether it be Hispanics or Asian people or even white women gain more access to civil liberties and to certain opportunities that always seem like it gets retreated upon 
as African American people want to use those resources as other people just sort of muscle in on a group of people that's disadvantaged. But nobody hardly ever talks about why African American people are disadvantaged over other groups. The main reason is yes, racism and a pecking order of racism, but that African American people don't have any other home or country to go to. And that is the thing that imperils the, the African American person. So they just sort of get kicked in the teeth because they don't have any place else to go. And that's a very debilitating um, position to sort of to sort of be in. And if we had the dual citizenship thing, then um, then African immigrants or Caribbean immigrants would would have would just be basically equal. Or African Americans would be basically equal to them. Then, then we could talk about probably um, sort of coalescing together in an equal way as we join forces in the U.S. to expand the population or create it you know, interconnected leverage, et cetera, because everybody would have their own home uh, to, you know, to, to go to. Yeah, I agree. What if what if you what if, what if you think about it like this? How would you feel? How would you feel if you were were born in Britain and you saw, you know, you were just born in Britain, right? You didn't have any connection to Nigeria or to any other African country. And and then you saw people from Uganda and Ghana and Kenya, Zambia and places like that coming to the UK. And you said, okay, well they're they're black too, you know, like me. And then um, you know, in Britain, you know, based upon various levels of marginalization or discrimination here and there, you know, you found that, okay, well, these people are also black like me, but, you know, when things got tougher and Britain's putting the squeeze on everybody and monetarily or job opportunities, hey, you found that some of your friends from Uganda could be like, well, I'll tell you what, I'm sending back I'm sending back remittances to Uganda so that I'm putting this into an investment club and a business and everything in Uganda. And because the pound in Britain is going to, you know, way more than the currency in Uganda, they find that they can keep funneling monies back from a really good job in Britain back into Uganda and actually amass a nice cushion for themselves in Uganda and then maybe put it into a business or whatnot or they had a connection where somebody that's a cousin of theirs might be able to hook them up with a nice job in, in Uganda, you know, leading a pretty good middle class life. Hey, you know, if things don't work out in Britain, how would how would you feel if you didn't have any connection to any African country but you were discriminated against and marginalized and you didn't have any place to go. How would you feel against the person who was a Ugandan or a Nigerian or a Ghanaian if they were able to exercise resources that, that, that you didn't have? Let, let me ask you that. Uh, jealous. Uh, that, that, that's the honest take. And um, it, it's been said, I've had a few people who or African Americans, and, and they've said that as well. You know, it's that that that's the overriding feeling. But it's then it's, it's I, I think it's. I mean, I'm I'm not in that situation. I'm there are other situations I am in. Um, but I would say, like, what would um what would I do with that information? I'll give you I'll give you an example. I am in. Um, I I had my tertiary education here, both bachelor's and master's. 
Um, but as a result, if I was to go back to Nigeria to work, I wouldn't be able to because in order to work, you you should have finished your education there and then done national service, which is one year where you 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 um, work, you serve your country and you go around the country performing various charitable acts and, and, and in different communities. So if I'm to go back now, I either have to do it or to get an exemption and it's on application. You have to have done it by the age of 30 or something. So basically I don't qualify now. So it's not easy for me to just go back and work. So for those who stayed back uh, and work, it's easy for them now if you want to pick up and get up and go. Whereas I have hurdles to, to cross. Not exactly the same thing, but I'm just saying, I, I look at those people thinking, I wish I did that because at no point did I envisage back then uh, there might be an urgency of me wanting to go back at some point or whatever, but that's not an extra hurdle I have that some people don't. Uh, okay. And I know. okay, good point. But suppose I needle you a little bit more and say to you, okay, all right, all right, let me, okay, let me ask you a question. Okay, good, good point. So you're pointing out to me a, a sort of hindrance in a certain way uh, about your ability to go back to Nigeria and, and work immediately as a sort of a, a, a lateral move, for example, in the capacity in which you work now, just make a lateral move to Nigeria. But let me ask you this. Okay. Suppose that the, the year of service, let's say that wasn't a turn out not to be a problem, or let's say you get around that. With whatever you make now in Britain, would you make more or less uh, comparatively? if you were to go to Nigeria right now in a similar position in which you are now, employment-wise, where would you make more, Britain or Nigeria? Britain. Okay. So even though, <laughs> even though it's a hind if, even though it would be kind of like a little penalty, so to speak, about having to do the year thing, but you see, there's no incentive all the way around of just going back to Nigeria to work because it's not so much that Nigeria has all the gold in quotations and therefore you're limited completely in, in Britain so that you're like, wow, and I wish I could just get into Nigeria. If I could just get there, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna living be living much better in Nigeria. And this year long service thing is really hurting me. So if I were the Nigerian government, I would look at it and say, well, there's ego who who has the little problem about not doing the service and everything, but there's probably plenty more just like him and i would say wow you know in britain for the jobs and everything and the and the weight of the pound hmm, they could probably give more remittances so why don't we just do this if the nigerian government was thinking i think in a, a feasible and practical way man just remove all that stuff about the year service to give people like ego and others uh, an incentive to want to come back to Nigeria or at least from afar give remittances in general. So just the fact that you can give remittances and even as though you have this hurdle of the year of service, just having the ability to have your money work, be worth more in Britain if you transferred it to Nigeria, could it more, even with the hindrances that you mentioned, is still an advantage to you that you would be 
completely disadvantaged if you did not have the ability not only for dual citizenship, but I think you have mentioned in the past, if I'm not mistaken, <clears throat> that in fact, having citizenship in one West African country means that you have mobility into the rest of the West African country, countries that make up ECOWAS, right? So that's an advantage. Also, just the fact that you have a second home and a pseudo, pseudo homes in other African countries just by having citizenship in one of them. That's a great, that's a great advantage. Now, what if you were born in Britain, had no connection to Nigeria, still a black man or African person as, as you are and had no linkage and you would be listening to somebody from Uganda saying, look, well, I can kind of go back to Uganda. I'm, I'm making money in Britain, but I can, you know, channel it into Uganda. And guess what? They have a nice past and everything uh, from Uganda where you can just say that you're East African and move around all six of the countries. And then you run into somebody from Ghana and everything. They say, well, hey, we're in West Africa too. We can just move around. And you're like, oh, every time I look around and I see these continental African people, and even if they have little hurdles, little stumbling blocks that may happen between themselves and their particular African country, wow. They can move around the continent. They have the ability not to necessarily be in one place. I think you might feel, as you've admitted, you might feel stuck. And you might say, you might want to even feel like, wow, you know, I don't have nothing. The only thing I got is Britain right here. So you might want to even go to the British government and say, look, I don't know how all these other immigrants from these African countries are benefiting from me. I'm a British citizen and everything. Shouldn't, shouldn't I, as a person who is like British, shouldn't I be given preference and everything for jobs and all like that? Why are you gonna give preferences to, uh, to these African immigrants who have the ability to go back and forth to different countries and everything? Isn't your job to um, you know, to to give preference and deference to, uh, you know, people who are in, in Britain. You you may actually feel that way. And you may feel like Britain is the only thing you got going. And other than that, you don't have anything. But how is it that these other people have just more resources than you? And you're like, oh, you know, I'm black like they are but they got more resources than I do. And then somebody from Ghana or Nigeria in the scenario we point out tells you, oh, shoot, I think you need to. Hello, Koji. I think we lost him there. Well, um, I think he was just um, trying to explain how um, the sentiment might be one of despair or anguish um, as to not have the option of being able to um, have an outlet or escape plan or plan B. Um, well, the solution for that is to gain dual citizenship. And I think um, also to, it's been a good conversation uh, to round up. I was about to talk about the way forward uh for the youth but i think we'll probably leave that to another another show and uh, and the question was going to be what is the way forward with the youth during this new paradigm of relations um so we'll leave that and i'll give it up to you as well um viewers if you can give any suggestions of ways forward how you think we can prevent these clashes and these um um false ideologies or misunderstandings from taking place and to foster a new way forward um and i'd like to say thank you all for watching thank you for your comments and uh please do share subscribe like uh suggest comments 
and um, hope to see you again another time. Peace.